It's quite a beautiful place to go to if you have not ever been there. If you are a amateur historian like my wife is, and I want to say that I have become very interested in uh, history, especially world history. I actually flunked it in school. It's the only subject I ever got a flunking grade. Remember, here's a kid that was two years ahead of everyone else. I got put ahead twice, only to flunk history. Why? Because I just didn't like it. I just didn't do any of the work, and so I ended up getting, um, having to go to summer school for that. And I decided to, you know, settle down and do my work. I got an A. So <laughs> I was able to graduate two years earlier than my counterparts. And so, yeah, it's beautiful. It's in Sharpsburg, Maryland. If you blink, you will miss it as you're driving down the road. Um, but it's one of the most calming and most majestically scenic and beautiful of our battlefields, our Civil War battlefields. Of course, Gettysburg is probably number one up there, but second to none, I think Antietam uh, is probably one of the best. We love going there. It's a little bit uh, closer to us than Gettysburg. And later on, uh, other live streams, I will do some Gettysburg pictures as well. We've um, decided at one time we were going to begin reenacting. And so we bought ourselves all the outfits that we needed. And uh, basically, we play the part of local farmers who come into town on Sunday, let's just say. So I put on my best, and my wife puts on her best. And, uh, yeah, it's quite a sight to see. Uh, on the 19th, coming up, we're going to be going to the Remembers Day Parade in Gettysburg, and that's uh, one of the biggest events. This is when Lincoln gave his... Uh, um, Four score and seven years ago, Lincoln Address, you know, this. So Gettysburg Address. So that's one of the biggest things. And hopefully we'll take Nathan and we'll drag Jeremy with us because uh, there's a lot of fun things to do. The place will be packed with people. Most of them will be dressed in 1860s dress. So it, it should be quite good. Hopefully that'll be uh, good weather um, most of the time. From previous experience, it's been rainy and just yucky and sometimes even snowing. All right, so welcome everyone to another live stream. Uh, this week has been very calm and very, very nice weather, uh, except for today it is 47, but it's, it almost reached 78, 79 degrees up here. It was beautiful. It was like, where's the fall? Winter's coming soon. What's with this weather, right? And I know a lot of you have been experiencing the same thing in this part of the uh, country. We had that hurricane, what was her name? Nicole came up the coast and dumped a lot of water, but nothing like the damage that was uh, perpetrated on the Easter, eastern coast of uh, Florida this time. They, they caught hell. So I feel for those people. I hope they're able to recover soon in the uh, Continue living down there. That's what you pay for when you move down in that region. Um, I told my parents before they decided to move there to think about that. They were living in Puerto Rico and they were sick of the hurricanes. And I thought, and you're moving to Florida? Hmm. Okay. You should have thought that one up a little bit, a little bit more careful. Uh, yeah, they went through quite a few of them. Anyway, welcome everyone. Um, this week I have uh, posted a few videos that I hope you guys enjoyed. I've been still printing on the 8550 and enjoying what it can do. Basically, it can do everything. Yeah, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for a problem to develop, but, you know, hopefully that will not happen. And uh, more and more people are considering that style of printer over something demanding of a lot more attention such as the Pro 1000. You cannot compare that to the Pro 1000. Don't get me wrong. You cannot compare that to a P900. You cannot compare that to the other short color uh, printers from Epson that use 11 uh, cartridges. You just can't compete with that, that gamut that they can produce. And the difference, as Mike Lee and I discussed this past week, is minute. It really is minute. Um, 
we have reached almost the pinnacle of performance in printers. I really don't know what else they could possibly do. Um, it would require, it's like, what do they call it? The, um, the law of diminishing returns. They would have to do so much and reprogram and invent methods that do not even exist just to gain a little bit more quality. Okay. It's, it's at, we're at that point right now, folks. So um, you need to decide, you know, what would be best for you, for your needs. Don't overbuy something. You're not going to be able to support yourself. And that is monetarily. And that is by providing the required amount of printing. Those printers demand, they demand that from you. Printers, especially Epson printers, um, become healthier the more you use them. It's like certain automobile brands that if you drive highway 50, 60 miles an hour daily, you reach 100,000 miles, 200,000 miles. Um, my son-in-law, he, he's he's got a uh, Toyota Corolla, Corolla that, I, re, I said Corona, that's an old car from the late 60s. Toyota Corolla that he drives for work and he travels through as far as Ohio. And uh, he's just over 200,000 miles on it and still kicking butt. So as long as you change your oil regularly as the way you're supposed to, stop and go is bad. Same thing with printers. You print and not print for a month and then print again. And guess what? You have a problem, all right? Most people will experience that. So it, it's something that we have to accept when it comes to the, the print world. Just now, my wife was talking to her former boss. They still keep in touch. This is in the school system. And her husband asked her to ask my wife, hey, what does Jose talk about in his live stream? And I said, I talk about professional photo printers. Well, what are those? See, nobody really knows. They all they only know an HP all-in-one type or maybe one of the ones you go to Best Buy and there they are, $79.99. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a, it's a whole different world. Let's go ahead and say hello to everyone here. We have 37 viewing right now. And uh, I recommend that you join the, the chat with us right here. Uh, that way, everybody knows who you are. Uh, we are a very friendly group here. So go ahead and jump in the chat. Tell us who you are, where you're watching from, what printers, if any, you are currently using or wish to currently buy or, or wish to learn about or whatever. As long as it's related to photo printing, uh, you are more than welcome to just ask. If you just want to lurk and listen, that's fine as well. But I recommend you join us because a lot of people will then start interacting with each other. And that's what I love about this little group of ours. Martin Van Gogh's uh, Netherlands. Uh, beautiful autumn weather here. Well, let's see. Um, yeah, it's still kind of nice outside, but chilly and windy. So that is like 47 with a 10 mile hour wind. That, that means you better put on a coat. Uh, it's got an Epson SCP 900 Marut ink system, 50% of the OEM cost. Yeah, Marut is not super cheap, but they're good. They're good inks. Some people have reported problems with them, but I don't know if it's the inks themselves or bad refilling uh, techniques. You know, because you gotta deal with um, refillable cartridges from Epson. Those printers in Europe are not locked like ours are. And he also uses Epson software and. Key Image Ultimate, which is excellent combination. Nigel Waters from Wales, UK. Canon Pro 300 OEM inks, Key Image Ultimate, Color Monkey. Yeah, and he's got that, that 2000D Canon camera. This is me telling everybody we were going to be on in one hour. People were on here at 12. Uh, maybe the European times haven't changed like ours have. And last week, my wife said... Uh, what are you doing so early downstairs? Well, I told her that I wanted to watch something that was at three, three-ish. And so, and she's always recording other things, you see. So that's why I wanted to finish early. It was a very important show that I wanted to watch. Richard Bender from Hagerstown, Maryland. Uh, Epson R3000, QMH Ultimate PC Inks. 
Epson 4980 scanner and a DJI Air 2S. Flying the drone a lot this week. Now on to editing footage. Listen, if you post it on YouTube, let me know. Okay, I'll be more than glad to uh, watch it. And uh, I would like to see what that drone can actually output. Um, Rudy Hallamum is here from sunny Los Angeles. Uh, printing in the P4, P100 Precision Colors Inks, refilling with vacuum system. We're going to talk about refilling and the evolution of refilling. I'm going to discuss how we did it in the early days and up to today with some of the cartridges that allow us to do that. Basically, I'm going to just stick with OEM cartridges that allow you to refill. Okay. That should be interesting. Michael McLean. Morning from 24 degree Fairbanks, Alaska. Ouch. Ouch. Too cold for me, I tell you. Um, remember where I grew up, I went from Puerto Rico to Los Angeles. And yeah, winter was, oh my gosh, if it dropped to 50, you got to rip that coat out of the closet and put that sucker on. And hope that it snows. We, we could only dream as a kid. Henry Stoffel, greeting from Medford, Massachusetts. Rainy Medford, Massachusetts. And Epson P800, OEM Inc., Skimage Ultimate. Awesome. Miss Wendy is here from Belgium. Nice to have you back, my dear. He's, she's got a Pro 1000. That's our number two, and that's still behaving, right? It's still working okay? I hope so. We're looking uh, forward to um, your reviews because you did get a replacement for it. Niels Kai Kier. Uh, from Denmark, Q Image Ultimate, Canon 1000, and Epson 8550. Ta-da! We're going to be doing some more work on that today and in the coming week as well. Stephen Paulboy, hello from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I say it in Spanish. Using Epson ET8550, HP Z9000. And 24 inch, that's a 24 inch printer. How is that working for you? Still operating okay? Uh, have QMH1 with Mac, but need some guidance as use Lightroom Classic almost 100% for printing. Wish to know where to get help to use QMH uh, on their website. They have a forum and lots of videos. And let's see what's today. Hold on, folks, because Probably, let's see if I can get them this coming weekend. They promised that they would be here before Thanksgiving. Uh, so that's when we have our Black Friday, the big sales in all of the stores. And so they wanted to come on and talk about discounts for their programs. And, of course, once we get them here, we're not going to let them go. They're going to have to answer tons of questions, especially you. Use a Mac. So we'll have Andrew help you with that. Emmanuel from Normandy, France, a P300. That is a, yeah, Pro 300 ink out inks. Uh, I1 data color. I1 and data color for profiling. QMH Ultimate for printing. Rudy's holder for the cartridge. Beautiful, beautiful diorama, I think you meant to say. Yes. Fred Auerbach. Uh, hi, Jose. Mike Cheney told me to keep an eye on you. Are you part of his uh, group? He's going to uh, be coming, I hope, next week. I got to contact him. Yangtze Farkas from Transylvania. Are you serious? Wow. Pro 1000 Epson L8180. OEM Inc., Skimish Ultimate. I got to tell that to my wife. She will be impressed. Fred says, I have a new 8550. My chain, he says, ignore Fred. He probably just hasn't taken his meds today. I shall. And Mike, we need you back, bro. Okay, we need you back. People are dying to ask you stuff, especially that guy with the, uh, um, what was it, the uh, uh, Mac. I think we'll let your partner uh, deal with him. Because uh, I won't be able to. All right. So CYH 
from Charlotte, North Carolina. I've been enjoying all the ET8550 tests. There will be more to come. I have just too much stuff to test on it. The, the, the reason I'm doing this because quite often certain printers just don't really uh, perform well with certain media. Look what I have here. These are all sample packs. Each sample pack contains at least six, eight, ten different types of paper. So, again, we're going to be running. I, I want to run some of those inks out. They're just not dropping. That printer is extremely stingy. Lawrence Keeney, I am an 86-year-old photographer, and I like watching your videos. I live in Owasso, Oklahoma. Well, nice to have you, my friend. Great. Borut B from Slovenia. Holy mackerel. Wow, I'm getting a lot of universe, um, like international, not universal, international viewers here. Pro 10 and an ET8160. I wonder if that translates to, because they use different numbers in the European and other than the US uh, versions of printers. Ha, ha, ha. Funny guy. I'll email you about the live stream. Andrew and I can do it one or the next two weeks. If we're not ready yet next, then Sunday after Black Friday. Okay, so after Black Friday. All right, I'm going to hold you to that, my friend. I'm going nuts trying to come up with stuff to do. <laughs> I need help. Tony Huerta. Hi, Jose, from cold, clear, breezy, central California. Pro 4100, OEM Inks, Kimmich Ultimate, Lightroom, and i1 Studios. So you, you guys may have seen that, yes, it is the same EcoTank, just A4 size. Okay. So that's that would be, I think, the 8500 here, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe not. Maybe not. The 8500 might have the same number of uh, ink channels. I'm not sure. Not sure at all. I'm never sure. Yangtze says, from what I understand, the L80, okay, okay, there you go. So there you go. Except it's black, not white. Mine definitely looks like yours, just in black. Oh, wow. I wonder why they did that. I, I, re I remember some printers that were, they're just so pretty to look at that they offer them in different colors. I forget which ones were those. They're, they're not professional level printers. They were just simpler type printers for home use. And they came in red and white and black, you know, gray and all kinds of different colors. All righty. I think that's it for now. Let me take a sip. I'm drinking. Oh, this stuff is delicious, folks. I don't know whether it's good for you or not. It's got protein. So I just drink it like maybe once or twice a week. Mmm. Dreamy. I'm going to start off, before I do a talk, I'm going to start off showing you some of the things I did this past week. Some of the things that I kind of discovered you could do in this printer, printing in black and white mode using the driver without any ICC profile, just black and white mode. And then you manually adjust your tonalities and you manually adjust your um, densities. Because it's really weird. As, as we get along later on today, I'll show you that the default, there are light, um, normal, dark, darker, and they expect you to use darker as a default. And they even show you input, output, and it matches. But when I print using the darker mode, I get a slightly darker than I wish uh, result. So it's simply by bringing it up one notch to dark instead of dark it, darker, you get great results. Now, I did this recently. I believe we were using, I got all my, my papers scattered everywhere. Kirkland paper. So Kirkland is the house brand for Costco. The, I think it's US based only, but it could be in other places, maybe um, Canada has a Costco. Not sure, but anyway, they, that, that's their their name brand. And 
It's super cheap, folks, and the paper is fantastic. Look at how heavy that paper is. You see that? We got to hold it right in the corner. It should just flop right over, but it does not. You see? Surface-wise, gorgeous. Okay? And this is strictly using, I believe I used one of the upper glossy papers in Epson for the paper choice. Let Q image control color. Okay, so I just picked that particular Epson premium gloss, whatever it was, profile. It very, very, very closely matches my monitor. Um, same thing with this. This is which way? This way. And I was looking at this. This has something interesting within it. That background, okay, is dull. It's dull to begin with. It really is on the image itself as well. The white flower with the slightly pink center, that is pretty much neutral on my monitor and as well as on my print. So I was kind of surprised that happened. Now, this flower has lots of different pink hues on it. I mean, you know, from reds, there's even a little bit of orange in there and magentas and light versions of pink and going all the way to almost white right here and then that bright yellow center and that thing printed it. Now, I then put that away and I said, let's try some new paper. I got to dig it up here. So... I had Office Depot professional photo paper. And let me see, make sure that was the correct one. Very nice glossy paper. Wait a minute. Maybe that was not the one. I got to find the one that I actually use because this is important. Hang on. I think it may have been this. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was this instead. You can go back and look at my video and see which one it was. But when I printed it, the first thing I noticed when it came out is, what's with that surface? <laughs> what happened here? Look at that. Now, the color, the color is spot on. Let me, let me put, for example, this one side by side. I mean, I don't see any difference at all. So what, what was odd about this? It was a swellable surface paper. Look what happened on my very darkest tones. You see that? You know what happened? I laid another print on top. And this had not fully dried yet. When it comes out of the printer, especially on these highly dense, over here, highly dense areas, it's almost wet. This coating, apparently, is similar to some of the older coatings that was originally used on photo papers years, a decade and a half ago. And what it supposedly does, as we better know now, that we know that inks, especially dye inks, will succumb to ozone because these papers instantly dry. When they come out, they're ready to be handled because of the micropores porous surface it allows whatever water is in the inks to evaporate remember inks have glycol so they don't fully evaporate that ink is not embedded but is kind of uh it has sunk into the coating but it still has millions of little pores that are being exposed to air and so this particular print will not outlive this one. This one will last longer than this one under the same conditions because 
the droplets of ink basically almost liquefied the surface of the coating. And then once the coating co co coalesces again and dries, it encapsulates the ink and now gas simply cannot get in there. And of course, the back is also resin coated, so no problems there. I just dropped it. So as you can see, different papers, different characteristics. Let me show you what happened, especially that one. You see that? It was sitting on top like that. I just did not have it fully dry, and I laid this on top, and that's why there are marks in those deep areas. You can see that right there. Okay, this paper, when it comes out, if you have been printing as long as I have, so I've been printing since the very, you know, maybe 1999, uh, when 2000 hit, I finally bought a computer, ancient by today's standards, and a printer that used these cartridges. And you print it on paper that had a swellable surface. HP, the same thing. Kodak, the same thing. Swellable surface papers. They came out wet. You had to let them sit for at least a day. You better have a dry environment or they'll remain tacky for a very, very long time. Yeah, those were the early days. Look at the smudge on the, on the side right there. That's because this paper picked it up and then it got shifted and it... it it's much the um, black ink, basically not black ink, but all those colors that composited that area there is smudged up on the uh, border. So there you go. But I tell you, I could leave this out and 20 years from now, it will probably still look the same. I have examples of, it's, it's really almost makes no sense because the early days of printing, everything was dye based. The inks were horrible. But for whatever the reason, the paper actually protected the inks, you see, because that was the only technology they had for coatings. And so unbeknownst to them, they were encapsulating the ink in that gelatin emulsion. Remember, film was also gelatin coated. Photo papers, gelatin coated with silver highlights, but gelatin, okay? So that was that. Now, I decided, hey, I kind of look the way that's coming out. Let me go ahead and print some other uh, photos. And I did this one here. And again, you're going to see the smudges because I didn't take good care of them. See on the edges here? See right there? This has a, a uh, had a, um, a score. Let me see. Can I, oh, oh, look. Look at that. It comes right off. You see that? So, even though this is fantastic for longevity, it really isn't if you don't treat it correctly. So if I stick this under the faucet, it's going to just wash away. Who knows what it will look like? Look at this crazy picture here. I would not want to mess with her. She would probably kick my butt. But anyway, look at the very, very black background. You see that? That area never really fully dried it sort of looks like the gloss kind of went away a little bit so again what it is is that basically that ink formulation is not made for this type of paper even though theoretically it would be fantastic to be able to print with dye on a paper such as this now if you go ahead and put this in some kind of protective storage whether it's a sleeve or whether it's by framing it, and make sure you never get it wet because it's just going to cause the ink to run. It's going to remelt the emulsion, the coating, and cause it to run. So something that we need to realize can go on with some of those papers. Now, let me try that with the Kirkland. Same printer. Nothing. I just wetted it. You see that? It's the coating. It's the coating that prevents that. This coating does not melt with water. Okay? This coating does not melt with water. That one does. 
even though this coating does not encapsulate the inks and the other one does you see what i mean advantage disadvantage so you gotta live with it and know what you're working with and know how to treat it now let me show you black and white mode and you could see was this it oh look at that this is the one i had laid on top not the other one this one look at that it picked it up that that uh print I just, I'm just discovering this now because I haven't looked at these for a while. Where did it go? Here, that one, this one. You see the periphery of that flower? See how strong the magenta is or the red? Boom. It's strong, meaning what? It remained wet for quite a while. So that's the only part that transferred itself over. Oh, you can probably do some really neat things. I, I'm, I'm coming up with all kinds of different weird thoughts in my head. Yeah, you could do some weird things with this, knowing what it can do, that it can literally transfer over as long as you somehow maybe maybe spray it with water and then put some blotter paper on top, peel it off. Yeah, remember the old etching days? Like that. Anyway, so... This one here, black and white mode, without that. Don't look at that. Look at this. And, yeah, it has a bit of a cast to it. But, again, remember, this is a weird paper not meant for anything other than printers from 10, 15 years ago. So nobody, knew even, nobody even knew what color management was or a profile. So there you go, black and white mode. And then... Oh, and the darker choice for the default. And then this is black and white mode, but with warm added. Warm and one step more. Instead of darker, just dark. Look at the difference between the water in this one and the water on this one. You see what I mean? So it's experimental. And that particular condition is only applicable to this weird paper which i don't even think you can buy anymore so to me even though i probably cannot purchase that paper any longer it was still a great little experiment to to conduct uh because um it just opened my eyes about this type of paper and what it can do and what it cannot do so how much do i have of it just very little um so anyway that's going to be fun. Let me put this over here. More things that I did. Now, this is now dealing with a premium paper. This is a uh, Red River Paladuro soft gloss rag. So I'm going to treat this really gingerly. Look at that. This is gorgeous. So this is a dilapidated building. Uh, I did not take this photograph. I found this online. It was for free, so I, I grabbed it, and I thought it would be a, a very nice photo to print. But let me show you something. Here's something, if you're not careful. Remember, this paper is rag-based, okay? There's no coating back here. There's no RC or resin coating whatsoever. It's just, you know, plain rag paper. The surface is Burita, sodium barium sulfate which is kind of a, like a clay-based type coating. And the surface is amazing, okay? This is what, I remember some darkroom papers that would produce this look. Had this image been scanned from say a color negative and you scanned it at a high enough resolution to capture the grain structure of the image, it would look like you did it in the darkroom. Now, let me show you something. This paper originally had the corners curled up a little bit. And sure enough, you see that right there? I almost trimmed that off before I showed you guys. But I wanted you guys to see that is a head strike right here as well. Trailing edge, I believe we also may have a slight head strike right there. 
and definitely on this corner as well. So what you have to do, and right now you can see it, it's curled up a little bit. What you have to do is just very gently do this. Lower those corners so that they sort of curve in the opposite direction. And you will very, very likely not get any strikes. Now, I don't know whether there's a gap adjustment on this driver or not. I have to look and see. But normally what you do is increase the gap distance between the printhead and the paper. That decreases the possibility of head strikes. Imagine had I printed this borderless, very likely I would get some uh, more uh, head strikes because the printhead would be attempting to print all the way to the edge. And yeah, if that edge is curled up slightly, boom, you're going to get a head strike. Using um, same category of paper from Red River. This is, um, of course, this continue. This is San Gabriel. And look at that. This is, see, it? see what I mean, though? You saw the other paper, black and white mode, neutral setting, and it was not neutral. This is neutral. Okay? Neutral, and this is set for just dark, not darker, and then neutral. Then I did... Uh, a color equivalent. And again, just look at this. If this paper was available, I would spend whatever you need to spend to have a supply of this because it's just amazing. Now, the Palo Duro series, as you saw, is just as good, except this just has a slightly different surface. Unfortunately, the mill that produced this stopped for some unknown reasons, uh, nothing that we can, you know, find out about. It's kind of a, a non-disclosure type situation. So this is the Palo Duro here. It's a little bit glossier. Let me see if I can. Yeah, there you go. You see that? It's a little bit glossier, similar type of surface. Um, I don't know whether treating it with a spray would work um, or change the look of it. I don't want to alter that. Anyway, just some more examples. I did a black and white mode, warm tone, and using dark instead of darkest on canvas. And I was worried about this section here because on the computer screen, I saw this. Uh, let me see if I can. I had trouble if I look at the screen. I have to look at the actual picture right here. There's some detail of these rocks in the foreground right here as well. And I thought I would lose that, but it's there. You can almost see it. You can see rocks, right? So I thought you would lose that. This is, um, I used to think it was a no name, but actually it has a name. It's from eBay. Premier art from Ultrafine. There you go. And it was very low cost. Almost, you know, literally affordable. Uh, not bad at all. So, so, yeah, we've done color. We have not done canvas in black and white mode. So that's what that was for. So, again, another, another thing this printer can do without any complaints and you guys saw saw me do this the back-to-back -back paper so I have some of this loaded and I'm gonna do something unusual because when I was doing weddings I used to do uh, pages basically this would be part of an album and it would be printed borderless um, so I wanted to see what paper would allow me to do this on both sides without any kind of artifacts or marks or whatever. We're going to try to do that. I have some of that double-sided matte paper loaded. And I got two images that I'm going to use in Q-Image, my daughter's wedding, my uh, Nathan's mom, um, Judy. And so we're going to go ahead and do a back-to-back -back, um, print and see how that comes out. That would be a page that we just flip over and you would have a image on the opposite side. So 
That's tricky. You have to kind of, uh, I don't know whether you can do this on a live situation such as this, because often, let me turn this down. Yeah, because often what happens is that it would be impossible on that other glossy paper because this stuff never dries, okay, especially within an hour. No, you need days for it to dry. Don't put anything on top like I just did. I showed you. Uh, but anyway, so you're supposed to let it dry and say the next day you come back and you do the opposite side. Your rollers better be spanky clean, okay? You do not want to transfer anything over on the actual printed side of that double-sided paper. A lot of people ask about double-sided printing. They want to do albums. They want to do booklets. They want to do all kinds of things that require that. And various companies have that available. This is an absolute no-name. Let me show you what, what they sell that with. It should make you laugh. Let me see if I can find it. I had everything here early. Oh, here it is. Okay, so it came wrapped like this many sheets with this on top, wrapped in cellophane. That's it. And this is the claim. Double-sided cardstock. It's not cardstock, believe me. It's, it's not thick. Photographic 1440 DPI inkjet paper. That's how they used to describe it back in the day. Bright white, matte finish, heavyweight. It's not heavyweight. Sharpest colors, best quality, good for greeting cards. No, it's not. Note cards, business cards, and presentation. The quality at half the price. You won't believe your eyes. And it has on the bottom there, you see high resolution, 50 sheets. Okay. So if I recall correctly, this was like, I don't know. 18 bucks, something like that. So I have it here. This is not heavyweight, okay? So, you know, you have to take that with a huge grain of salt. But it is coated on both sides. So it is rather... Uh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that until I finally read the top line. Who reads the top line, right? This is what your eyes come to. Photographic. Yeah, double-sided cardstock. It's double-sided paper, not cardstock. Anyway, so we'll try that. See how that works out. If it does, fine. If it does not, then it's not gonna be the, the it's not gonna be the, the printer's fault. It's gonna be the paper's fault. Anything else? I think everything else you already saw from last week. So let me go to the next subject. Let me see if there's anyone else here in the chat. But you see, that's what I've been doing. I, I, I've been, you know, experimenting. You can call that weird paper combination. Okay, let's call it a failure. Why? Because these modern inks are not compatible with that paper. Even though the results color-wise were perfect. Yeah, they were perfect. That coating does not like these inks. Maybe it didn't like the previous early inks either. I don't know. I never used the paper. Let's see. Okay, this is Steven. Uh, his uh, Z900. Is it a 900? Isn't it? Uh, or 9,000. 24 inch printer. I've been using it for three years now, as when I got it, was having real challenges with 24 inch Epson. My HP Z9 has nine color inks. Yeah. I I used to watch. Um, who is that Canadian guy? God, I keep forgetting his name. He and that big, burly motorcycle rider basically were involved in the um, creation of Lightroom for Adobe. And uh, one of them used an Epson printer, and then the other guy, the Canadian guy, used a, the Z90-something-hundred, okay? So 
that's how I became aware of these printers. And that was way back then before, you know, there was anything good from Epson and Canon for us home users. These guys were professional as were known back in those days. Although the cartridges give me a headache when refilling them, somehow air remains in them. What are we talking about? The uh, EcoTank? Yeah, uh, if you go, you will not fill all the way to the top. No, you will not. But that should not have it. If, if you're talking about the EcoTank, it doesn't matter. Look, I have air in mine right now. You see that? What matters is down here. If that's what we're, you know, referring to. So when you put the the bottles one at a time, it's go it's only going to allow so much ink to enter. It's not going to overflow. It's going to reach a certain level and stop flowing. So I think that is preset. Steven says, Ontario Costco store stops uh, using Kirkland glossy paper for a few years ago. I love the great colors and really, really, I didn't know that. Maybe, maybe they did the same thing here. You can still get it online from various sellers. Amazon has it. Uh, it's actually quite good. So is Staples. Staples brand. Unfortunately, their glossy paper has so much OBAs that hold on i just opened this the other day you see how much paper i still have here the whole pack literally i'm going to go to the very center and pull out a sheet I don't know if you can see, I can. There's a little bit of a yellow stain on the edges, near the edges. And that is basically a giveaway of OBAs burning out. So after Red River had the same thing, the early Red River papers, if you let them sit for 10 years and not use them, the edges are going to become burnt out. In other words, you're going to get a yellow tint to those edges. I had a Kodak something or no, uh, Epson. Oh gosh, what was that? I did a video on it and I showed you guys how the edges were completely yellowed uh, because of that. It's just massive amounts of OBAs to make your results pop. Uh, if you view it under any light that has a little bit of UV in it, it will cause that fluorescing factor to occur and it just makes it look so much brighter. Um, like Red River Aurora White that has OBAs. Not a ton, but it has some. That's why it's white. And the natural, which is more of a warm background tone, in other words, the base tone is warmish, uh, does not have OBAs. That's the only difference between the two. Have you used a Kirkland paper on the Pro 100? Sure, yeah. Great results as well. Tell you, if you can find it, I, I show you the prices on the video that I just did about Kirkland. Okay, look it up. If that's just this past week. And yeah, they're super low, even now. Harold Goldberg, Cool and Sunny, Richmond Pro 100 PCSE, QMH Ultimate, Rick Johnson's clean cartridges, and Rudy's holders. Okay, you're talking about the Pro 10, not the... Okay, so let's look at a Pro 10. We're going to cover all these cartridges uh, a bit later on, so I'm not going to get involved into that right this minute, but why are you getting air in your, in your, in your bag? Okay, you should not be. You should be able to squeeze this you, after you top it off, it weighs 32 grams. If it weighs 30 grams, you have air in your cartridge. You're not refilling it to the top. It may be flooding, but there's air trapped in the back. Squeeze it. 
you will see air bubbling out of that. You see that? This just has water in it. You see that sponge? When you squeeze it, air will bubble out. Let go of it. Relax. Add a few more droplets of ink. Squeeze again. Squeeze and add. Squeeze and add until you reach about 31.8. Some cartridges, you just simply cannot get them to 32 grams. Okay? Get them as much as you can. So when you squeeze slightly, you just see a, a flood of ink developing and not no air. Um, yeah, you should not getting be getting any air in these cartridges. You got to be really careful when you do that. I don't think this one has ink in it. Let me see. Yeah, I think this one has ink. This is Rudy's new holder, by the way, for the Pro 10 cartridges. PGI. Perfect. Okay. Take a look. Watch. I don't want to squeeze it too much. You see how it's getting wet? You see that? Air is not coming out. And if I weigh this, it will weigh about close to 32 grams. So that's it. That's what you got to do. It's just a refilling problem, okay? It's not, it's not the cartridges. It's not the inks. In this case, yeah. If I, if I have that problem, I've had that problem. Don't get me wrong. Okay, I, I've, I've gone through that. You name it, I've done it. Um, yeah. Guilty as charged. I have had that problem. And it almost always is because there's air trapped in the bag for whatever reason. There is a bag in there. It's like an accordion. You know, dee, 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 dee. yeah, just like that. It's pleated. There is a spring. That spring is located right there. You can see that little circle. That's a big plate. See all those little holes around it? That is all of the uh, connections to these internal spring. And so that back can inflate, inflate and also contract. You want it to be contracted when you top off your cartridge. Okay. If it's expanded, it's expanded with what? Air, you see. And air just simply will not escape on its own. You have to squeeze it to push it out. If that's the case. Now, normally, that will only occur if you had a cartridge without a clip stored somewhere, drying out. Yeah, that 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 bag will have expanded. I'm going to demonstrate this in a little while. So stay tuned. Don't go away. Patty Berg Productions. With my cartridges and my Pro 100, can I fill them while they are still in the printer? Absolutely not. No way. Why would you want to do that? The minute you take that plug out, it just empties out. Empties out where? All over your printer because the printer is going to be floating in the middle, you see. So, no, you have to remove them. We'll, we'll, we will talk about refilling. Don't go away. Vignesh R. Eco 8550, Eco Tank 8550 ink lasts how long? You mean sitting around? I have no clue. It's a brand new printer. I don't know. I don't know how long the inks will last. I think they will last at least a year. Yeah. So if if I print a lot less than I normally print, I could probably last over a year with the initial set of inks. Will the inks go bad? No, they're not going to go bad. Yes. Depends how much you print. If you print 100 big prints daily, then, yeah, you'll go through the inks quickly. Some say two years. One year for me, he says. Gray inks at 40%. Let's see what we have. So far, my whatever that first ink is, is the lowest. It's just below half. That might be gray for all you know. And then the colors are... Just about maybe 70% in the matte black or the photo, not the not photo, but the pigment black, eh, maybe drop down to like 85%. Even though I've been using it a lot, printing on matte media, you only use a little bit of the black ink, actually. You're not really printing with black ink when you print black and whites, for instance. You're printing with all the colors. They're all being used, composited, 
magically to create grays, dark grays all the way to light. And then black ink is used to accent because just compositing dark grays will not produce black. It's just not strong enough. So you need black to strengthen that. That's how it works. We don't know. They're, they're original. They're OEM. They're not third party. So they may actually last quite a bit. Depending on your storage, depending how you uh, display your prints, they may outlive you. Who knows? Nobody really knows. James James says, really enjoying the ASA premium glossy and luster papers. Thanks for the suggestion, Jose. Canon paper has gotten expensive. Yeah. Um, they don't have a huge variety of papers, but what they have is really fantastic. Here it is right here. So look it up. I have this, by the way, on my Amazon affiliate page. Okay, the links, the links to my affiliate page, where I have lots of stuff listed, is on my video description. Just take a look, and then go there. You can search for other things while you are in my link, and that way Amazon will pay me a small fraction of your purchase. Your purchase will be the same cost. Okay. I wish I could give you a discount. That's not the way Amazon works. But they they profit from people like you ordering things that are related to what we do. And by doing that, they, they give me a little bit of a uh, kickback, if you will. I hardly ever get one. But, you know, occasionally a check, a small check does arrive. So I suggest you guys do that. You don't have to search forever. I got tons of things that are already related to what we do, including those papers right there. Miss Wendy says, another trick for double-sided printing is to remove a small sliver from the leading edge before introducing it in the printer for, for the backside. Otherwise, there are almost invisible bumps that jam it. Okay, see that? Comes from an expert. I'm, I'm sure she does that. I print it for books, so experience several jams. For that, you're going to need a very good um, cutter. Steven says, Jose, the HP is just labeled a Z9 Plus, which it really means, oh, okay, okay. So that, okay, so this is newer than the original because it was Z90 something hundred. That's how they were being uh, sold back then. And I'm talking, man, when Lightroom originally came out, okay? Yeah, I'm going to cover that. Don't worry. Don't go away. And I'm going to show you something really cool as well. Uh, let's see. No, not really. Not really. Those are those are discontinued. Um, I have a printhead right here. I have a dead one. I got to dump it outside in the trash. I got a dead one that used this printhead in 9500. Power supply is dead. The motherboard is also dead. So it will not power on whatsoever. I tried everything. But again, that, that printer really didn't come close to the Pro 10. No, no, sir. Uh, it, 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 fell, it fell short of the quality the Pro 10 can produce. I, I really wasn't super impressed with it. It did not have Chrome Optimizer. So the results... <laughs> With its pigment inks on matte paper were okay. Somewhat dull, if you ask me. The results of the same ink set on glossy paper was just not acceptable. That's why the Pro 10 came out with Chroma Optimizer. Then the Pro 1 also came out with Chroma Optimizer. Pro 1000, 2000, 2100, all the way up, they all use Chroma Optimizer. It is required, really, to get good results. On glossy paper with those types of inks. I have pictures from EcoTank right on the wall without protection for more than half a year. No changes. Yeah, it's, it's it, you know, it, it depends. Uh, someone across the country can get a fade within a month. Someone like me in my, in my environment, 
no fades whatsoever. Let me see. Hang on. Ah. Here we go. You see my hat? You see that? Orange County Choppers. I'm not a, I'm not a rider, but I, I do love motorcycles. These are the guys, the, the TV show. They have since disbanded, they still have their company. But during the original Gulf War, um, they came over to Walter Reed Army Medical Center where I worked. And they did a super display. They brought their big trailers full of motorcycles, all the custom bikes that they built for the show. They brought them over and had soldiers, you know, climb on them. And, you know, a lot of these people were amputated, uh, you know, wounded. And, uh, yeah, this was printed on a Epson 2000. Okay. This was during the Gulf War, whenever that was, years years ago. It has not faded whatsoever. This is the stuff that would fade first. You would start to lose this edge, and it would become as clear as the border. It's still there, as good as it was when it was brand new. There you go. So that's an example of how conditions matter. I have photos of my grandson. When I when I found out we had a grandson coming, I had to warm up all my cameras. You know what? I, you know how that that goes. And so yeah, then I began printing. And this is he's now ten, so we're talking about printers from ten years ago. And all those photos are still looking great. Of course, they're under glass. So under glass means you're going to block. 90 something percent of any exposure to ozone. If you print it on even third party pigment ink, it's going to last longer than I will live. Okay. And think about this if it fades, you reprint it. Simple as that. Would I recommend third party inks for you to be selling prints to other people? Not really. Not really. OEM, does it ever fade? Of course it does. They fade as well. They just have long, a, a, a longer longevity, if you will. But they will still fade. Look at a car that's been sitting outside without a wax job forever. It's faded. Oral Russia says, I tried to print a few images in my 9500, but they look a bit grainy. Yeah, also the, the resolution was not as good. The dots per inch. Now, graininess can be misconstrued with a paper that causes what they call puddling, where droplets of ink coalesce together. It's almost like if you were trying to spray water over an oily surface. You, you know what that that would look like so again it has it could be the paper and the ink don't get along or it could be that the 8500 the 9500 simply was not something that was up to par to what we have today glossy papers i have pro 100 but i couldn't resist not to buy the 25 five card packs of oem pgi 29s for just wow that's that's awesome yeah but that's, that's not going to work on your Pro 100, my friend. Unless you have a Pro 1. Oh, you meant 9 for, okay, the 9500, not the Pro 1. Okay. So, again, now you're going to have a lot of ink you're going to have to use up. Find a paper that will just get along with it. Find a paper that will just get along with Make sure you're printing with Color managed workflow. Make sure you're printing with a proper ICC profile. Make sure you know how to do that to begin with. And again, all, I have videos that cover that. Um, basic printing, that's one. And also my color management um, so-called playlist, okay? Covers all of that, all the basics. How to make sure you're printing on a particular paper with the correct profile 
And either the driver is controlling color or the application is controlling color, but never both, okay? Hue image handles that for you automatically. Wink, wink, okay? All right. Pro 1000 recommended rate of usage and why? This has been an ongoing thing. Back in the days of the, the Canon 9500, glad you brought that up because I'm going to include that. The 9500, when it first came out, what did we have prior to that? We had the 9000 Mark II and the, just the regular 9000 followed by the Mark II. And that was, what was it? Six or eight, eight? Eight dye colors, I believe it was. And it had green ink and red ink. So we thought, oh boy, huge gamut. Well, not really. Those two proprietary colors would not be triggered unless you were printing on certain kinds of paper. Weird. So we started noticing that, that was those were the first kind of printers that us serious, quote unquote, uh, photo printing people began to use in the Canon side of the family. Remember Epson was first and then Canon was a camera company and they got into printing. So they followed. And so we got into those and we began to realize that, gosh, every time I send a job is doing a cleaning cycle. Or if I don't print, if I print like three prints in a row, it runs a cleaning cycle and then no cleaning cycle, no cleaning cycle. But if I wait three more days, it will run a cleaning cycle. Well, those early printers, knowingly that they had to run cleaning cycles prior to printing because of the thermal print heads, meaning that they had to heat the ink to explode it out. That's why they used to call it bubble jet, bubble jet technology. So they deal, they they had to deal with that. This is the same thing. That's a, a thermal print head. There is the print head. It's just a strip, okay? That's all it is. So they had to deal with possible clogging by preemptively uh, running a cleaning cycle so that you would get a relatively perfect print. By perfect, I mean without any gaps where no ink was, you know, clogged nozzles causing gaps and whatever. So later on, they, they sort of confessed that these cleaning cycles were timed. So a dye-based equivalent, like the 9000 Mark II, had 60-hour limit before it would then run a cleaning cycle. So if you printed something on hour zero and it ran a cleaning cycle, it would not run another cleaning cycle for the next 60 hours. So you could print as much as you want it, and it would not run a cleaning cycle. See how, if you if you had known that, you could then print a lot, all your ink, whatever ink you use up, is used to produce prints. That's the primary reason to own a printer, not just to look at it. You see, so the next period would be 120 hours. So say you print something on hour zero, and you print nothing within the next 60 hours. And in fact, you go beyond that. So if you go to the, what is it? 60, 120, 119 hours. It will run a cleaning cycle, the same volume as the 60 hour one. So during that whole period beyond 60 hours, if you were to print, it would run a cleaning cycle, the smallest one using the least amount of ink. But if you go past 120, it would literally like double because it figures, okay, at this point, I cannot trust that the 60 hour smaller cycle will work. So let me double it up. We'll waste twice the amount of ink. And guess what? It does that and pretty much your print is gonna come out nice, but you're gonna be ticked off that it used up all that ink just because it thinks it might have a clog. Okay, then after that was like 480 
hours, some ridiculous number of days, you would have to go non-printing and it would use up maybe a fourth of your ink just to clear itself out. 9,500 came out and guess what? Somebody snuck out the, the, I think it was the service manual for it. This is what technicians have access to and they're listed as clear as day was that schedule, that time schedule. So then we were ingrained with that information and we assumed that the Pro 100, Pro 10, Pro 1, Pro 1000, and everything else after that also worked under those timing conditions, 60, 120, and so forth. You know, no, no. The printers became smart. And so the cleaning cycles are done when the printer senses, literally senses that it needs to do it. Okay. That's why everybody was getting different results, different cleaning cycles, timing at different, you know, lengths of time, hours. No one had something they could just say, okay, at 119 hours, nothing happened, but at 120 hours, 21 hours or 20 hours and one minute, it ran a clean. No, nobody knew that because it was random. Nobody could pinpoint an actual like sequence to this. So it turns out that at least let me jump over to the Pro 1000. That's super advanced now. The Pro 1000, I have not used mine for probably two weeks. I have ran nozzle checks, so it might be actually less than that. I've done the I've done the uh, so-called automatic thing from uh, Q Image, the uh, unclock tool. So, if I was to print something right now, maybe I will do that after we get off the air. I will have a cleaning cycle, boom. But if I then continue printing this evening, say I have a job. And I need to produce 30, 13 by 19s. The first one will, you know, trigger a clean cycle and I get a perfect result. The second one immediately starts printing. If I wait like less than a minute between jobs, it will run a little purge. And all that is, is that when the printhead moves over to the right side, and it clamps itself to the perch pad, it will say this. Okay, I used to be floating around over the print, literally over the air, and so I may have had a little bit of air infiltration. Let me go and spit out some ink, and that ink then sits on top of the perch pad, okay? And they will then empty out. And you hear that. You hear like a little mini perch taking place. And that's only if you complete one print and then you don't send another job within the next 30 seconds or 40 seconds. It will do that. Interesting, right? So it gets more complicated than that. So say, for instance, I don't print for, say, two weeks. It will do an agitation. Nothing is really moving that you can see. The compartment, there are 12 of them that hold a certain volume of ink. This is how the printer can compute how much, literally, physically, how much ink has traveled through the printer for a given amount of time. And that way it knows when a cartridge should be nearing empty. See, it knows that. So... What it does, it will then, there's a little piston inside that goes and it agitates that ink inside that little compartment. That's it. And then it will go through a nozzle checking process. You didn't know that? Yes. Print it, goes over to the right, and it parks. And you see it moving. It will just do this. And you hear, click, 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 click. It does this for like five, 10 minutes. It's checking individual nozzles. It's causing each nozzle to squirt a minute amount of ink. 
And if it does it, it passes. Next nozzle. It'll do that for five, ten minutes at least. And then it begins finally to print. Of course, cleaning cycle before that happens as well. So once it is verified, it's like this shuttle or SpaceX. You got to go through the checks before that rocket's allowed to leave the launch pad. So before that print is allowed to enter the print, that paper is allowed to enter the print printer and begin to print, get printed upon, it has to pass all of this. So that's what it's doing. And then what happens? You get a perfect print. What are you complaining about? If this was an Epson printer that does not do all of these pre-flight checks, they do. Actually, they do. But it's not something that they reveal to us. But I guarantee you that if you don't print for a couple of months on my PA-100, it will have a bad print result. And then, then I just say, oh, shoot, I should have done a nozzle check prior to printing. Do the nozzle check, and sure enough, there it is. I'll have to run a cleaning cycle. Had the printer done a cleaning cycle prime, prior to beginning to feed the paper, I wouldn't have to worry about that. The print would have been perfect, and I would be happy, and the thought would have never have entered my head, you see. So that's the difference. Um, but unfortunately, if you do not do things optimally with the Canon printers, you will end up wasting more ink. The ratio of ink being used to perform maintenance, I'll call it maintenance rather than cleanings, will exceed the amount of ink that you use for print production. And the whole goal of having something as high end as a Pro 1000 is, of course, to produce prints, not to just make sure the nozzles are clean. Even though I'm not producing prints, you're wasting ink. And this stuff, it's like liquid gold. <laughs> yeah, it's like liquid gold. This is this is sixty dollars for seventy milliliters of ink. I better not be just looking at the printer to see if it's. Oh, you still there, baby? Good, nice girl. No, use it for printing. So don't even consider getting a Pro One Thousand. Don't, because you're gonna be really PO'd that. Oh, I, didn't you know I wasn't going to print, but once a month? In a year, you produce maybe, what, 20 prints, and you go through a whole set of cartridges during that time. 700 bucks worth. And you only produce 20 prints? Figure the cost. I hope you're selling those for 100 bucks each, okay, so that you can at least make, make some profit money. So that's, that is the, the sad facts about a printer as sophisticated as a Pro 1000. Um, only get one unless you have a, a, a demonstration channel like mine. Otherwise, don't get it because unless you're committed to print almost daily, that way your ratio of ink to print is much greater than your ratio of ink to maintain. Make sense? You see what I mean? I'm, I'm not being mean or, you know, Oh, I have one and I'm better than you. No, you know, think about that. It's made for printing. And again, if you don't print it, it's like having a car with a very, very uh, low mileage engine, meaning you only get 10 miles a gallon. And because you only get 10 miles a gallon, you don't want to drive too much because gallon of ink, of a gallon of, no, no ink, a gallon of fuel costs a lot of money now, you see? So you, you tend not to want to drive it, but I'm gonna I'm gonna idle it for one hour every morning just to keep it just to keep it moving. Keep keep you're gonna waste all that gasoline and not go anywhere with it. You see, you see the analogy here? You're gonna waste all that ink every time you run a nozzle check to just keep it flowing, and because you wait a whole week or a whole two weeks before every nozzle check is preceded by a cleaning cycle that uses a hundred times the ink the nozzle check uses you get it i hope you do yeah
That's the cruel rea reality of printing at home. Hmm. It can be scary, but you have to know how to circumvent that. Uh, you have to accept that when you buy that printer, you better have on the shelf lots of jobs waiting, ready to be printed. So that, that way you're printing every day and every day you're producing instead of wasting. It will use, it will run a cleaning cycle eventually because as it prints, it produces a little bit of residue because of the heating process, heating the ink. Uh, so that has to be clear. That will occur even if you're doing a long job, a long job and you're printing a number 30 big prints or something. After every five or six prints, it's going to stop and run a small cleaning cycle just to clear out the residue. It's cleaning the frying pan before you continue frying eggs or burgers. You see what I mean? That way at the end of your 50 burgers, you don't have a frying pan full of burnt, you know, it's, it's, you've been cleaning it all along, right? You get it? That's, that's what the printer is doing. It's cleaning itself as it prints. Okay. So, and that is it. So make sure you just use a pro 1000 or don't buy it. Just don't buy it. If you're not going to print at least n a number of prints every single week, don't buy it. Just don't buy it. It's just too expensive to just simply maintain. Okay. Okay, wait a minute. He says, thank you in regards from Russia. All right. I think you're my first Russian uh, viewer. Man, awesome. Jack and Coke. Jose, do you use a paper cutter to trim your papers prints yes i use a roto trimmer roto roto trim let me see if i can show it to you guys it's sitting right on top of my uh pro 100 right now ah. it's probably one of the best trimmers out there I'm going to just hold it out for you. See what it looks like? It's got a rotary cutter, cutter that sharpens itself as you use it. So it's always able to cut. And you can cut little slivers of papers. Little slivers off the corners. Yeah, off the edges. Very, very nice. I found that, believe it or not, this was in my, my department at work. And when we closed down the Institute in 2012, I saw it uh, being dumped. And it's about a $300 trimmer. So I took it home. I gave it a good home. DP, what is DP? Stephen Paul Boy says DP. Okay, St. Jones. Okay, Seito Jonetsu. Okay, I hope I didn't ruin that. Thanks for sharing this knowledge. I'm a novice printer, so it helps knowing not to go with something as big as a Pro 1000. Yeah, it's like it's like I was discussing my my grandson, ten years old. He's 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 just enamored with these five hundred thousand dollar cars, and it's like stop. Okay, stop even considering, you know, this type of car. You're only ten. Get a job, right? I told him, you have to pay $300 for a set of wipers as opposed to $30 on my car, right? So the same thing with this. Don't don't buy something that you're not going to be able to use, maintain, because it's just going to run you poor. You're going you're gonna to not print because you cannot afford the inks. That's why... This is probably going to be the way to go for most people. And had I began printing on that and gotten nothing but failures, then I would say, okay, yeah, I thought so. Yeah, and people initially said this would be insufficient for the serious photo printer. I'm waiting for that to happen. Not yet. So far, so good. Okay. 
I'm going to show you something real quick, a little photo. Let me get it, load it. This was just posted to me not too long ago. So if you have an Epson printer, this is the kind of nozzle check you're going to get. So this is just a portion of the nozzle check. So basically what will happen is that, in fact, let me just, let me just do that right now on the, let me do that right now on the um, 8550 while we are waiting here. So I'm going to go ahead and let me see, look at the, go home. No. I usually run this from my setting maintenance and we'll do a print head nozzle check and print load paper. Okay. So I hope this grabs it from the uh, internal, um, the carriage or the cassette. Haven't used it for a good three days. And you can see it's not running a clean cycle. It's just waking itself up. Remember, a printer has to run lots of uh, pre-checks. It's got to look for an obstruction somewhere in the path of the printhead assembly. So it's going to unlock the printhead. It's going to move it to the far left. No obstruction. Run it back to the right. No obstruction. And boom, it's done. You see that? He woke up three from three days of non-use. So you see what our nozzle check looks like? Look at that. We have a clog. We have a little clog right there on the gray. So what do we do? We have to run a cleaning. I'm glad I did that. You see that? It says check the printed pattern and select the closer results. So we have a problem. So I'm going to click on the X and it's going to run a cleaning cycle. And then we'll go ahead and print a new one. So gray had a little bit of a clog. See that? From not using the printer. It looks just like this. You see this particular one, photo black. This is obviously a pigment printer. It has a little bit of a missing couple of uh, little nozzles right there. That's probably two nozzles worth. Let me see. That's Yeah, that's two nozzles worth right there one and two so there you go this is a um probably one of the pro printers with the ultra chrome 3k or k3 so you have one two and three grays two grays and one black as opposed to you know just in this case we have one operating black and then one gray. Takes three minutes. So we let it do its thing and then we'll run another nozzle check and compare it to this. See? Will you notice that when you're printing? Probably. If this was a Canon printer, you would not want to continue printing with a few nozzles that are not able to pass ink through them, the signals are still going to cause that particular set of nozzles to heat because it thinks it has ink in it, to heat and supposedly expand the ink and eject it. You don't want to do that. You don't want to overheat those nozzles. The way the nozzles do not overheat is by having ink passing through them. That's It acts as a coolant. Okay, so that's it. It's done. It's going to now print. It prints it automatically for us. Okay, so with this printer, cold firing printed, not thermal, I could have simply printed. And I may have seen it, may not have seen it. I'm printing in super high quality. So during the printing process, that little clog would probably have been dissipated. So let's see. So that person, this one right here, they would need to run a cleaning cycle. That's it. And then run another nozzle check and see if those two nozzles are now clear. I 
I really had no doubt that this was going to be cleared up. You see that gray GY now has no missing nozzles. And that's all it is. Print. You see, I just showed you. I had no clue this was going to happen. Print. Print. With this printer, print every day. You can afford it. You can do it. No worries. There is no worries about it. Oh, my inks are going to drive me to the poorhouse. No, they're not. If you cannot afford, what is it? About $100 because it's $85 plus about $20 for the pigment black. If you cannot afford that, then send your work to the local lab. Um, maybe you'll save money. Maybe you will not. But, you know, do that because otherwise it's just going to have constant little clogs here and there. And unless you print a nozzle check before you print the job so you can see, you see what I mean? Um, before you crank up that aircraft and take off to the air, you better check that all the systems are go right? Before you send that spaceship to space, you better check to make sure those all the systems are go. So that's the way it is. So, you know, make sure that you do that. So now I think we're ready to print, right? We're going to be ready to print. Everything seems to be perfect. So let's get rid of this photo. What is the next thing we're going to talk about? Oh, I got another photo to show you guys. So remember, we were talking about OBAs. So the way to know, either the manufacturer themselves just lets you know that, yeah, my, you know, my, um, hold on one second. My papers have OBAs, optical brightening agents. Make sure that, you know, you know that um, the way they work is very, very simple. They will allow your print to look brighter than it really is. Okay. That's how it works. Hold on one sec. Okay. So that's the way it works. So as you print something and then you're done with it, and you look at it, wow, it looks fantastic. It has a lot of brilliance to it. And that's the fluorescent uh, properties of that OBA, optical brightening agents. So eventually they burn out. By burnout, I mean that they deteriorate, they ter uh, deteriorate, and so they begin to sort of disappear. So, a for instance, Aurora White. So that has a degree of OBAs. If I let one sit, a print that I did on that, if I let it sit for a long time, the OBAs sort of lose their ability to fluoresce, and the print that used to look brilliant will not look so brilliant. It didn't fade necessarily. It just doesn't have that fluorescence any longer. So that's how that works. Now to detect whether single sheets of papers like I have, have OBAs, so all you gotta do is this. Go out and get yourself a black light. I wish I had one. I gotta get one and I gotta, I gotta test some of these papers. Get yourself a black light, lay some papers down and shine that black light to them. This paper right here, no OBAs. You see that? It's not fluorescing. The rest of these papers are. When you're wearing a white T-shirt and you notice your skin is almost black under black light, but your T-shirt is glowing white, your T-shirt has OBAs in it. That's why it looks so bright. Cotton by itself is not that bright. Okay? The more you wash that T-shirt, the less is going to fluoresce under fluorescent uh, conditions like uh, UV light produces. So that is simply it. It's a very simple test. You can use that to determine whether your papers have OBAs. You can lay some, you know, a series of different uh, brands or different types, and they will fluoresce a certain amount. The ones that hardly fluoresce are the ones that you want for longevity, okay? Don't think you're going to get longevity on a paper with high level of OVAs. It just does not work. Keep that in mind.
Argyl CMS, Color Software. That is a, um, I think it works under DOS, right? Or Command Prompt to produce uh, profiles. I would not even know how to tell you to use it, okay? Yeah, you're right. I do have a little black. You see that? And you know what that could be? Simple. It could be the fact that there may be a little bit of air bubble in that ink line. There are ink lines in here that, that lead to the printhead. So I saw your I saw your little comment. I thought you were goofing me, but you're not. So let's do another clean cycle. It hardly used any ink anyway. So let's go ahead and run that. And it, I think it was the matte black. So let's take a peek at that. And again, that would not matter. It would not matter when you print. It would go away when you print. Uh, you're not going to harm your print head by printing, even with a couple of missing nozzles. Yeah, that was on the black. And by that, that means the matte black. They call matte black black. And they call PK or photo black the dye base one. We'll just let it do its thing. We'll continue talking. It's just going to go ahead and spit it out when it is done. Then we'll go ahead and uh, produce some prints. Yeah, possibly. That that can happen. Uh, we got to remember that um, the parking station is supposed to seal the bottom of your printhead nozzle plate. So the parking station will have a gasket that is basically forms itself around the perimeter of this. And also there's a division down the center because on these types of printers, you can actually, you can actually uh, do a cleaning cycle on the section on the left or the section on the right. And that way you can sort of, um, not waste ink on necessarily the other colors if they don't need like for instance here i only need to treat the black the pigment black so had i been able to isolate say three colors instead of the six i could just apply cleaning cycle or the suction to that okay still doing it and not waste the other five colors unnecessarily so we're going to go ahead and uh, continue here. Lucian. Oh, boys. That's, is that Polish? I cannot pronounce that. Sorry. I apologize. Sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I'm in Sunnyvale, California. I have an assortment of old Epsons, including four 2200s, uh, 4000s, and a 7600. I had a bunch of 2200s. Those were actually pretty good. No, you weren't joking. That was that was actually true. Ah, yes, that can be error. Yeah. Actually, no. Well, let's let's go back to my to my uh, talk about the the perch pad. So I have a thirty eight hundred. That's a nine color printer. Shares the black channel, and I had a clock that just simply would not go away, and it was different every time I ran a clean cycle. Then I follow. By an nozzle, you know, check it was different. The same channel, but it was different. Different nozzles were now clogged, and the other nozzles were clear, driving me nuts. It was a gunky gasket on the perch pad. I cleaned that up, removed all this gunk, thick ink, and and, and such. Got a nice spanky clean, and ran one cleaning cycle. Perfect nozzle check. The Printhead could not seal itself on that gasket. So when it applied that initial suction, that's how a cleaning cycle works. It applies suction to the printhead. It makes no noise. You just, you know, it sucks ink out. It collects it on the surface of the perch pad. The printhead detaches, moves over to the left a little bit, and that pump starts to begin to pump the ink out and dump it into the maintenance cartridge. If it's leaking... In other words, there's no seal. It cannot properly apply vacuum. So the vacuum was very ineffective, in other words. So that clog could not be cleared. That's what was happening.
I think we're good to go. Perfect. So again, even the 8500 dye, dye ink, it happens. It could be a little bit of air in it, whatever, you know, who knows? I think this is for Mike. I think there would be a huge interest, Mike. Don't don't um, underestimate yourself. All right. So, what else next? Let's print on that on that uh, double sided map paper. Okay, we're gonna do that one little experiment so we're going to crack up uh crack crank open q image here and we'll see if we can get away with doing this so i have several sheets loaded but what i'm going to do is i'm going to load let me see if i can do this full what I need to do is here on my desktop, I have some images and there it is. So this is my daughter. I have this set for eight and a half by 11. This is presentation mat. I'm not worried about color management at this point. I just want to make sure that I can do this back to back. And I have a set to borderless because I want this to be borderless. So we're going to just print it. That's it. I know it's set correctly. Uh, it should be set to color. Let's double check. And Mike, I have to talk to you about something. Yeah, but it's set to black and white mode. I need automated black and white mode. Okay. Okay, who's calling me now? If it rings only once and cuts off, that's a, that's a telemarketer. Okay, so we're gonna set it to color. Settings have been applied. And we're gonna go ahead and print it. It's telling me that it's going to apply scaling, obviously. And we'll hit okay. Let it load. Forty-three percent, fifty percent, and seventy-five, eighty-four, almost done. So notice this has a black, almost black background. That image has got some um, scores, kind of a reddish color with a white, and it's floating over the background. And there's a little bit of a shadow to it. So we'll go ahead and let that print. I don't know how this is going to come out. This is the first time I ever tried this. So we will have to see. Let me back this up. The last time I have paper leaning against my paper on the tray, it prevented, it caused a jam. So I got to stop the bad habit of piling stuff up there. So the idea is to print this, let it dry. There's a lot of areas that are very dense. It's going to probably cause some buckling on the paper. But I'll let it, I'll let that dry. And then later on, maybe during the live stream, I'll go ahead and print the opposite side. We have to end up with a double-sided page with those two photographs that are composites to begin with, edge to edge, but without a single artifact caused by rollers or any other mechanical um, paper transport system or whatever. I don't want anything to happen to that opposite printed, originally printed side. I want to have a perfectly printed double-sided page that if it, if it was bound in a book, I could then flip it over and see perfect uh, results. I think we're going to get perfect results because I know that we have a perfect nozzle check. Yes. Okay. Let's see who else is here. Oh, yes, of course. 
Um, Chefchik, okay. Um, my wife is from Milwaukee. Of course, Milwaukee is Polish, German, and uh, Italian also as well. And her brother-in-law is Polish. Her brother-in-law, the one that I told you guys last week, had a massive heart attack. He's getting better. They just took him off the drugs that had him on a drug-induced, uh, basically a coma for like almost 14 days. It was that bad. And he has been on dialysis to allow the drugs to be expelled. Of course, he's hooked up to catheters and all of that. So now Mike Lee from Precision Colors uses Argyll for all his uh, uh, custom profile production. The stuff that he gives away to people. Man, is that dense or what? Holy cow. This might be too dark. <laughs> I like this cheap double-sided paper. Actually, I may have to run a profile on it so that we can print properly on it. Yeah. Actually, it came out very nice. There you go. So we have perfectly edge to edge. Again, no marks anywhere. We don't have any bands, any kind of missing lines, nothing of the sort. But look at how much it curls. So I let I, I need to let this dry now. So I'm just going to lay this here, and then we'll do some other topic, and then we'll come back and proceed to print the uh, next image. Jeff says, my Pro 100 died. What is the best replacement for a refilling from a refilling standpoint? Thanks. Well, really in the same family, really nothing. I hate to say it, but it, it's true. Um, pro. Okay. Pro 10, but again, they're very, excuse me. They're very scarce and expensive when you find them. Pro 1000s are ridiculously expensive right now. Not 1000s. Pro 100s are ridiculously expensive so what happened to your pro 100 did the printhead go bad is that what it is what kind of what kind of error it threw a b200 uh or what if you can tell me that uh it may just need a printhead and a printhead will run you around 200 to 300 dollars okay it will look like this you need to stay away from any printhead that just simply says uh refurbish okay you have to buy new Because guess what? I also have a dead Pro 100. But lucky for me, I bought three of them when they were basically being given away almost. So here's what you need to buy. And you print it in its original wrapper. Or if you buy it from a provider on eBay, it has to be in this condition. On the original box. This is the way it comes out of the box where the printer comes in. But if you buy one, it'll come in, in, in this type of a box. Not refurbished. Refurbished means they just cleaned it. They cleaned it and they shot water through it. And they think all the nozzles are clear. But there's no way they tested it. And you could have dead nozzles. Just because the nozzle is clear and can pass liquid through it does not mean it's electronically viable. It's dead. It's probably dead. And so... You know, I would not trust it as far as I can throw an elephant, okay? Which is not very far. So only buy this. It's a KY6-0084, and some of them will have a dash 10 afterwards. I would sell you one, but I just cannot afford to let go of these printheads because uh, they're just too valuable at this point. This is my original printhead that I took out. I don't know whether the B200 is due to this itself. This has been flushed by me. I have not touched any of this other surfaces, especially the back where the contact points are. That has all been cleaned. Um, I'm just finding the times where I can um, proceed to 
install it and see if that resolves the problem. Uh, no idea. No idea whether that will or not. There are uh, numerous reasons for the B200 error, also the B204 as well. Okay, this is flattening out somewhat. Still a little bit wet, a little bit damp. So what I got to do, notice it's curling the opposite way. So what I got to do is, is make sure that it is curled the, the opposite to this. I need to make sure that it is curled upward. Areas like this on matte paper, you got to be careful because areas of black, I mean, look at these borders, right? You could accidentally burnish them, meaning that you something hard like your fingernail can rub and create a little shiny spot, and you don't want that to happen. So you got to be very, very careful. The same thing can happen in the printer itself. So be aware of that. You'll end up with burnish marks. So it should be dead matte. You'll have little areas that are sort of shiny, and you don't want that. So let me go back and check what the next subject is. We got to let this dry. We cannot continue with that. So what we could do is um, talk about disabling chips. Disabling chips on what? On Canon printers. Why would you want to do that, right? I'll tell you why. Let me change my order here. Topics. Okay, so now we got that all set up. So we're going to talk about disabling chips. So when would you disable a chip? Well, when you have a Canon printer whose chips are not resettable. In other words, a resetter does not exist for it. What category would you do that on? Something that you can easily keep track of ink usage. Why? Because when you disable the chip, and there's a process that you have to follow to achieve that. You're going to eliminate your ink level indication. You no longer have that. So how in the heck do you know how much ink you have on a cartridge such as this? You can't see through it, right? The only way would be to weigh it. You have to know what the empty weight is. So you need an empty cartridge. Without the clip, put it on a scale, figure out how much the empty cartridge weighs, and then you'll know that any, any measurement of weight above that means you still have ink. Now, those cartridges can be used till they reach empty by the chip, but now you have no chip. The only job the chip is performing now is recognizing that that's a photo magenta cartridge. It can no longer report ink levels. That could, that could really screw you up, <laughs> okay, if you don't keep track and you go empty and you continue printing. It will allow you to continue printing forever on air, and air will burn your printhead. So the only way would be to systematically remove um, that first set of cartridges. You have a second set ready to go, also disabled. Put it in. Now you have full filled cartridges, even though the chips cannot tell you how much ink is in them any longer. Scary, isn't it? Yeah. So there's no way that you have a system to, to sort of warn you. All you have is you have to just weigh them. Primary example, XP15000 sitting right over there. The cartridges contain chips that are not resettable. That's an Epson printer. However, unlike just about every other Epson printer, you can refill those cartridges because they're very similar to the Pro 10 cartridges. Flip them upside down. Bottle with ink with a syringe tip. Drop, 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 drop. Ink is absorbed through the exit sponge, and you are monitoring that by the car sitting on a scale. And in that particular case, 
you dribble ink, dribble ink, dribble ink, either until it floods all over your scale, which is not what you want, or it reaches about 25, about, no, correct, correct me, 26 and a half grams. Some of them will make it to 27, but you don't want to push it. So around 25 and a half, that's enough. Put them back in the printer, do all six at the same time. If you're quick, you can do it all within five minutes. Put them all back in the printhead, close it, tell it you're done exchanging your cartridges. Really, you weren't. And it will do a purge and it will allow you to print. And it's basically saying, in this case, we're running chipless firmware, which means that the opposite occurs. The printer thinks it has eternal ink. Okay? The printer thinks that it has an eternal amount of ink available. So what you have to do is every couple of weeks, if you print enough, then every couple of weeks should be your schedule. Every Friday, every other Friday night, you take each cartridge out, put it on a scale, add the proper ink, make sure you match it, okay? Bring it up to 20 six and a half grams put that one in take the next one out and so forth until you get them all back up to 26 and a half grams in some cases you'll be able to squeeze in 27 up to 27 that's total weight that's the cartridge body plus ink inside bringing it up to 26 and a half to 27 grams like i said not all the cartridges will be allowed to go to 27 you will not be able to do that on all of them that's it put them back in it runs a purge and you're ready to print. That's it. You can do that as long as you're religious about this. Well, with a Pro 10, for instance, you have a chip resetter. You don't have to worry about that. As they go empty, reset the chip, flip it upside down, add ink. The 300, however, does not have a chip resetter. The only way you can continue printing with those cartridges is to disable the chip. When it runs out and it's empty, pause button, five seconds. And that's it. It will disable that particular channel as far as ink, you know, uh, ink levels um, reporting goes. And then you have to flip it upside down and add ink. Now you don't know when to top off those cartridges. You see? So if you have two sets... And one set is already loaded on one of these pretty little holders right here. And that's been topped off to the full weight, 32 grams in this case, per cartridge. 32 grams total weight per cartridge. They're all filled. Yeah, the chips are, re are, are disabled. And one of those cartridges in your other printer may begin to get too close to empty. So you need to set a timetable to sort of guess when should I remove all those 10 and replace it with my full ones. You better get this. You better do this correctly. You better not ever forget or just, oh, my God, I continue printing. Oh, crap. And now I'm getting all these yeah, ink starvation situations. You're lucky if you don't burn out your printhead. And good luck finding one. Okay. So... Get into the habit of religiously, whether you print or not, you know, just do it. Have a full set ready to go, filled. All the chips are disabled and have the current set in your printer. And after two weeks, you remove them, weigh them each, remove them and immediately replace them with the other that you know are filled and then weigh them and figure out how much ink you have to add to them. Oh, now that becomes a job, doesn't it? That's not no longer an, an easy thing to do. It becomes quite a job. So those of you who are considering the Pro 300, be aware of that. Okay, that's what you will have to um, live with from now on because there's no way to reset those chips. Okay, now Pro 100, that's resettable. You have a, you have a see-through cartridge. Not that one, sorry. You have a see-through cartridge. You know exactly what's happening internally. There is no, there is no surprise. But again, with this, it's differently. So let's let's go back. Let's go way back to the beginning. Refilling, and by refilling, I mean your OEM cartridges. 
originally a lot of these little printers like Lexmark printers had this type of cartridge. You used to be able to go to the local mall. They had a kiosk that would top off these cartridges for you. There was no chip. There's nothing to reset. Literally, and I do mean literally, take a look at this. I don't know whether you can see that. There are three little sections out of focus. But anyway, there are three little sections here. These are your nozzles. This, this cartridge is burned out anyway. There are three little nozzles there, three little uh, sets of nozzles, magenta, yellow, cyan. This machine would literally seal against that and miraculously, without intermixing, would push, literally push cyan, yellow, magenta ink into each one of the internal sponges. That's how he did it. And you paid like $15 to do that. And then they would take a tissue paper and wipe the bottom. That was your nozzle clean. <laughs> and you take it home and you hope your nozzles are not burned out. Okay. What people didn't know is that after a couple of those refills, your nozzles are burned out. Okay. So that's, that's how much life you get out of that. So Epson, and I believe the 2200... The 2400 had this type of cartridge, and I still have one here, unused. Actually, no, it is used. No, that's not it. Sorry, wrong one. Where did I put it at? Get out of there. This is it right here. Okay, so we're going to look at this first. So this is um, a T4, TO44. That's old. I want you to look at the bottom here. This is critical. These old cartridges, the older design from Epson, was refilled through here, through these ports right here. That's why you have a piece of uh, mylar tape almost welded on. Okay? Notice one hole is bigger than the other. So one hole allowed this machine to enter, through, actually through those two holes, and it would, it would literally pump ink in and another machine would then enter this port and suck ink out. So you had this exchange because there's there's so many chambers inside this that you literally had to. It's like if you were in a maze that was made out of tunnels and you had to flush all that air out and fill it to the brim with just liquid. That's what's happening here. So for you to do this at home, you would have to reset this chip. And that was easy. They had resetters. Attach a device to this port right here that you can then inject ink into it. And then with another type of tip, allow the ink to emerge. And you have to push the tip down so that the poppet valve will be recessed. You tilt it to the side a little bit and ink and bubbles and gurgling would come out until now you're just getting nothing but clean ink coming out of that little tube. That meant that this tank was completely filled, but it was overfilled. So then you had to go here. Oh, it was quite a, quite an issue. You had to go here and press that little tiny area there, and psh, you would hear a little bit of air escaping. Now, the cart was internally pressurized to our atmospheric pressure. It actually worked. It actually worked. But boy, was it a pain. I did a series of videos on that. That Those little gadgets were available, but no longer available. They're, they don't sell them anymore. And besides, nobody has these types of cartridges anymore, unless you got a 2200 or a 2400. Immediately, Epson found out about this. So immediately they changed their design. So right here we have R2000 cartridge no more hole there's this one hole there but that's not even a hole you can go in that's a, i don't know what that hole is there for but that's not what what you used to uh inject okay so i don't know where they get the ink inside but again you cannot just push ink in here it just simply will not go in what people were doing is somewhere along the top Somebody took apart one of these cartridges. In other words, they, they took this complete cover off 
and they figure out where they could drill a hole that would then sort of link you to one of the internal passages and eventually allow you to uh, fill every compartment, which you really didn't fill it, but sort of, okay? And then you have to then put a plug on here and then reset the chip. But I want you guys to see something. See something that also exists in the old cartridge. You see this depression right here? It's kind of round. I'm going to show you this. That's a, that's a diaphragm, a built-in diaphragm. Imagine, yes, a, a built-in diaphragm. See that here? Built-in diaphragm with four northeast, northwest, southeast, and southwest. That prevented you from actually being able to force ink in. It just will not allow you. So Epson, at that point, basically blocked everybody from refilling their original cartridges. So let's jump over to Canon. Canon was a lot more liberal. Actually, Epson then produced these types of cartridges. Your, your 3800s, um, even the larger printers with larger capacity cartridges, they use this type of uh, exit port. It's a one-way valve. Ink can leave, but ink cannot be re-injected into the internal bag. They have a bag inside. So to do what the impossible would be is to disassemble this little clip. You got to get into surgery now. So you need some little fine instruments. You remove this cap very carefully. I got a series of videos that show you how to do that. Remove this cap very carefully. Remove the o-ring remove the poppet valve remove the spring behind the poppet valve and then blindly blindly remove the cap that has a little tiny valve inside that when you try to push ink in it blocks the entrance when you put, suck ink out it unblocks the entrance and ink can leave but it cannot go in you got to push that open and that allows that little piece of mylar it's like a little circle of mylar to just Get out of the way. It's going to be floating inside the bag from now on. Now you can inject ink. Then you need to reset that chip, and it has to be reset before it reaches like 80% from empty, or actually 20% from empty, like you see. So then it will reset, and Epson got very wise about that, and they threw a monkey wrench, and so resetters can no longer reset every single color cartridge. So that's done. So your only option is refillable cartridges. So that kind of blows the idea out of the water about reusing your OEM cartridges, which is the best way to go all the time. Always better to go with OEM. Let's go over to Canon. Canon, they're the good guys, okay? Let's go to Canon. This is a CLI-8. CLI-8 then became CLI-42, and so forth. All of these cartridges, they have a sponge size and a liquid side. When I originally saw a Canon so-called bubble jet printer, they had no chip. I looked at the cartridge, and I said, wait a minute. It's a piece of cake. Drill a little hole, add ink, plug it up with some hot glue. And that's all you need to, needed to do. You have to make sure that your sponge... Always had ink in it and pop it back in. There was no chip. Uh, once you pop it back in, the ink levels automatically were reset to full. Simple. What better way, right? Then the Pro 100 came out. Oh, actually, the uh, this is for the 9000. So these had a chip. So now you needed a resetter. When the resetters first came out, they were not able to reset all the colors. So... There were some other printers that used CLI 8, but they did not have the complete set that the 9000 used. So those other chips that the earlier versions of CLI 8 users were not able to be reset. So again, you had to buy single use chips and transfer them, pain in the butt. Okay. But at least the cartridges were refillable. Now we have the ability to just simply remove the factory fill hole ball. Let me see if I got any. Here we go. Remove the factory fill ball. Drill it out. 530 seconds of an inch. What you're drilling out is the seat. Okay, the little circular earth 
it's like a little uh, spherical little base, and it's got a little hole in it, and a ball sits in there. What's the functionality of the ball? I really don't know. But you're going to drill out that seat because otherwise that plug cannot go through it. The plug would just hit the hit the uh, bottom of the um, seat and just float, and it would not seal this hole. This hole needs to be kept sealed. So you drill it out, and now you can insert a plug that will then seal this situation going on here. Now you remove the plug, fill that up with ink. Ink will then enter the sponge. You notice the level's dropping, add some more ink, and finally you get it up to, so that is below the plug. I can add a little bit more ink to that, no problem. But I don't want to go beyond that, otherwise it will get ink inside the vent, and it will just lock up ink flow. Ink cannot flow. The only way to unlock that is to remove the bottom clip, hold it over a cup of water, and literally blow into this vent right here. This is a vent you create when you remove that tape initially. Easy to refill, okay? You have to modify the cartridges. Rick Johnson, if he's here, he sells these already pre-modified for you, ready to go. The only catch, okay, the only difficulty is on you. You have to make sure that at least get two sets. And that way, one is completely full, ready to go. When one of them reaches low, low means that you ran out of ink here, fellow. Okay. You have no more ink to replenish your sponge. Don't continue printing. In fact, pull out all A cartridges when this reaches just below low. You'll be able to see it on your on your ink level indicator on your printhead. On your, on your driver, you'll be able to see that. Remove all eight, install eight preset and full ones. Put those eight into a holder like Rudy sells. See, it's a system. And then reset all the chips and top everything off. If you still have a little bit of ink here, that means the sponge was never infiltrated by air. The minute those fibers now have air trapped in them, you can't push that air out by simply adding ink here. Sure, the ink will go in somewhat, but it will not push that air out. The more you repeat this error of waiting until this is low and beyond low, you've been infiltrating air. You've been a bad boy and girl. So now this, this sponge will have a lower capacity to hold ink. Instead of 100%, 90 80. When you get to 70, you're going to have ink starvation problems. That's bad for the printhead. Not only does it produce lousy prints, but it will eventually kill your printhead. Why would you want to do that, right? You chose to refill, so you have to now do it correctly. Never go below low. Always prior to low. Your other option, which I'm not going to really get into, in, in great detail, is to vacuum fill your original untampered cartridges. That requires a gadget from Rudy Hallamum, and it is a process. When you master that process, it's easy. But until you process, until you master that process, it can be you know trial and error. It works. It allows you to refill these cartridges via vacuum which is the way the original factory fills were conducted. And what you end up is a cartridge that never really loses its hydraulic uh, properties. You can go till empty with that type of process because when you apply that vacuum, the air literally is sucked out and ink can just freely enter. Again, it's more involved. You require some equipment that Rudy will sell you and that is all on his website. I have a link for my affiliate page for Rudy's page on my video descriptions. Take a look at it. But the easiest way, the one that I still promote the most, is simply top filling. This works just fine. Okay. You can also use a SIS unit on the Pro 100. There's a proven one by Ink Products that I've been using for at least a month until I threw a B200. It had nothing to do with the uh, SIS unit. Just my printhead finally croaked. That's it. It's almost 10 years old. So what do you expect, right? So anyway, that is it. Pro 10. Let's look at the Pro 10 now. The Pro 10 has an ink bag inside. Okay, so the remember the CLI type 
cartridges, they have a sponge. You cannot wait until after low warning. Air will get in. And you can't get that air out unless you reflush the cartridge and dry it again and start from fresh. You cannot do that. So Pro 100 has those sponges. Pro 10 has this type of cartridge. Okay. Remove. Add ink after you reset the chip, of course. When it weighs about 31.5 grams, 32 grams, that's that's the limit. You will see ink flooding the, the sponge. Blot it off. You don't want to end up with a, with a sponge that's already flooded with ink and you haven't even squeezed the sides yet. Add ink. Add ink is getting to 31 grams, 31 and a half. And you're beginning to see that sponge literally becoming wet. Stop. It's ready. Put the clip back on it. Store it in one of these little holders, like so. Now, you want to make this a little bit more fancy, scientific? You order the system from Rudy. Here's what you're going to do. Notice, this is great. This is great for in case you buy like CLI 72s from eBay. They will come probably without that clip, the original clip, this one right here. They will not have that original clip. So that sponge is going to be crusty. It's going to be dried. It's not going to be, uh, re not sponge, the, the exit sponge on the port. It's not going to be receptive to allowing ink to enter. Besides, the diaphragm internally is going to be expanded. That bag is going to be expanded. And this is a passive injection process where you're just going to drip ink and you hope that it enters. Well, for that to work, you have to have a collapsed bag, first of all. So either, either you add a little bit of ink and squeeze, and you'll see foam coming out. Let go, add two more drops, squeeze, you see more foam coming out. Half an hour later, you have filled one cartridge. That's what happens with these eBay cartridges that come unprotected without that chip. Or you buy this. So let me see if this is going to work. So... I'm going to collapse that bag. You see how that bag, see that circle? I'm going to pull back and see if I can create a vacuum. So there, I've created a vacuum. I will have another syringe preloaded with 15 ml of ink. Okay, so I have this sitting now. I've collapsed the bag. I'm going to load 15 ml of ink. Attach this. I'm going to pull back again to make sure that the bag is collapsed. Notice I got a vacuum. I will have 15 ml of ink. I push it in. Done. Ready to use. There you go. So that's another method. You can get all of this from Rick. I mean, not from Rick, from uh, Rudy. Rick sells the holders. Rick sells. Um, Maintenance cartridge materials as well as maintenance cartridges for the 8550. That's very important. See those two cleaning cycles I just performed a little while ago? That added ink to my waste ink cartridge. I'm going to wait for it to reach. Hey, I'm full. Exchange me. And I'm going to see if I really need to exchange it. I'm going to look at the actual pads inside and see if they are saturated with ink. They probably will not be. I have a resetter. I will be able to reset that chip, reinstall that same exact maintenance cartridge, and collect more waste ink. Since I have not really ran any cleaning cycles, other than those two, manually speaking, I should be able to get at least two or three runs out of that cartridge. And if not, I have a replacement that I got from Rick as well. He sells those. They're third-party cartridges. They're just as good as the originals as well. So you will save money by basically resetting and reusing a couple of times. That way you don't have to replace prematurely your cartridges. That's about it. Let's look at, let's look at something more 
more fancy. PGI 29s for the Pro 1. Now, the Pro 1 is discontinued. I understand that. But they can still be refilled. Okay. The chips have to be replaced. I would not, I would not, um, what's the word, um, disable these chips. I just find that there's 12 of these cartridges. And I don't want to have to deal with having to systematically weigh and see how much ink I have left in any of these cartridges because I no longer have ink level, you know, reporting. That would be a pain in the butt. I'd rather spend three bucks for a chip and install a chip and reuse it that way. But installing ink, no problem. You need a special tip. You get that from Precision Colors, a syringe, pull back, suck any ink that's left in there, and then add enough ink to make this weigh 85 grams at the end. That's it. Done. And let's go now to the Pro 1000. These allow you to inject ink directly in, but you need to do it a special way. You either drill a hole and use a bottle with a syringe needle, or you do it the vacuum way. So this cartridge is empty now, bone dry. It weighs 32 grams. You will load a syringe with a big syringe, like a 100 ml syringe with 80 grams of ink. Okay. You insert it. Make sure that it's a nice tight fit. Push the ink in as far as you can go and then pull the plunger back. So you have forced ink to go in. That, that created a positive pressure in the internal air. You suck that air out. Pull back, create now a vacuum condition inside your cartridge. Push more ink in, pull back on the plunger, create a vacuum condition again, and eventually you will have injected all 80 uh, ml of ink. That's it. You're done. You replace the chip and use the cartridge again. It will be seen as a genuine cartridge by your Pro 1000. You continue printing. The MC20 maintenance cartridges cannot be they cannot be um, reused, simply. I have reset them and gotten about another half-life out of them. But that's about as far as I would go. So when they reach saturation level, you can get another maybe, uh, if you weigh it and you know what the empty one weighed and you know how much actual fluid went into them, you can get about half of that. So you got to constantly be checking. Pain in the butt. They're only 15 bucks anyway, so there's no need to do that, to go through that. Uh, if, you, if you're lucky enough to have a Pro 2000 or 2100 or higher, those cartridges can be disassembled and you could replace the insides with whatever you wish to use as long as it is absorbent and it is uh, friendly to water-based type liquids, in other words. So you reset the chip and reuse the cartridge. These, car these cartridge chip re uh, resetters are not cheap. At least $90 each is what they cost. So that is it for refilling. That's where we are at now. The large cartridges that the big brothers to these printers use, they can also be refilled. Easy. You drill a hole on them. That's it. And uh, currently now we're working using a full set of, of disabled chips on my Pro 1000. Sensors that indicate when I am down to 20% by flashing light, and I now have the two new boards that basically give you green lights on all 12 cartridges, six and six. Green light means I'm above 20% on all of them. If a green light goes on and then the corresponding lower white light comes on, that means that cartridge now needs to be topped off. That's it, you remove it. I like to remove the sensor, put the cartridge on a scale, remove the plug, carefully add ink until I reach 112 grams that's it you continue printing um, the sensors are bulky so the door has to be left open so we need a fuller to fool the sensor to think the door is actually closed that that happens also on some epson printers that can be uh, refilled large format printers they sell big old versions of these types of cartridges they actually extend about that far out and you need to have the door open and you need to tell the printer hey i really don't have the door open i'm going to fool that sensor and you insert this little plasticky 
plastic thing in there and it'll just the printer thinks that it's closed now just simply because you block that sensors that's how that works but again it's now you know you you get into refilling you have to get into the routine of refilling and putting it not putting it but doing it properly and correctly there are no guarantees okay don't even come back to any of these companies and complain because you probably did it wrong there's a method to the madness in other words I always say no one told you to do this. <laughs> I sort of suggest it. It's up to you to do it or not. And because I've done it and I've done it successfully, then I can say, okay, this is something that I do. And if you want to assume that responsibility, go, go for it. But there are no guarantees. I use continuous in system to image for the last 20. What is CIS? Is that like a CIS unit for the last 25 years? No fussing, flipping, dripping, weighing cartridges. Yeah. So what kind of printer that you have again? You had several, right? Yeah. Sometimes when I change my new OEM cartridges of my Pro 100, the printer says they are empty. Then I have to disable the ink chip function these are new that's weird that's very odd but it's not convenient i don't have a resetter why is that i don't know i really don't know that's odd that should not happen i would i would consider getting a resetter um you're in russia so i don't know how you're gonna be able to buy one of those but um if you can find on ebay they sell them you know they're made by a company, a German company called Red Setter. Red, like the color red, like my chair. Setter, S-E-T-T-E-R, Red Setter. They're the ones that, that develop the resetters for Pro 100s and the Pro 10s. They tried for the Pro 1, but they couldn't beat it. They tried for the Pro 1000. They couldn't do it. But yet, there are single-use chips for the Pro 1000 in in the long run, you don't need to even go that route. You can just disable them and then uh, use the sensor system. Works for me really nice. Again, you still have to do that the right way, correctly. There is a process to it. Jeff says, thank you. Okay. Lucian says, dripping, not dropping. Q image, not. Okay. No problem. <laughs> yeah. My wife says that I have fat fingers too, but I, I really don't. And girls have slender, delicate fingers that they can do. They can do all kinds of things that we cannot do. Okay. Yeah, that's that's odd. That should not happen. All right, let's see if we can get away with printing this now. I'm gonna go ahead, it's nice and flat now. So I'm gonna still kind of curl it the opposite way. We got about half an hour more to go. I am on a time limit with my uh, streaming software here. They give me only a certain number of hours a month. Otherwise, I have to pay a fee. I can't afford to do that. All right. So let's. Here's what we're gonna do. So let's look at the, our next image and see how we're gonna orient this. Okay, so our next image is, where is it at? Right here. So we're going to remove this one and load this one. Okay, so all I need to do, so it went in, say, it went in this way. So what I need to do is just this. Okay, let's do that. Whoa. Hopefully I won't get any, any kind of faults on the edges. This is going to be pretty much almost full frame with some gray on the outside. It'll be not black like that. It'll be gray this time. So I think we can just go ahead and immediately print it. So 
I did some manipulation with this image. I wanted to add. So I'll show you guys. I'll, at least I'll, I'll just tell you guys how I did this. So what I did was I created a, a layer and I used motion blur and I applied like a diagonal blur. And then I went ahead and I erased areas that I did not want blur, like her face. Just areas on her face. I really wanted everything else blurred. So I just kind of erased it. So I created a hole through the blurred image. And of course, it went and saw the underneath image, the unblurred one. And that's how I was able to do that. So it required a little bit of manipulation. I, for, I should have done Brian's face as well, but I forgot to do that. Concentrating on my daughter, what can I say? That's what a father does. But I shot that whole wedding and... Um, um, one day I'm going to do a slideshow on that one as well. I just got to look through the files and make sure that uh, they're ready to be used in a slide form. And I got to find some proper music for it that I will not get, um, you know, flagged for. Yeah. They're very tricky about that. I had a live stream like a month and a half ago where it got flagged just because one video had some music in it. I lost all the revenue. I had to then download it. I can download my own content and uh, download it as a video over three hours. And then I had to go in and undo that. And I added a, diff a video with a different soundtrack and then re-upload the whole live stream. So it didn't go into my live stream folder. It went as a video, a regular video. But then that I, I was able to monetize it and earn a few bucks on it. Okay, so the key here, we're going to look at both sides, make sure there's nothing, nothing bad occurring on the surfaces. This is crappy paper anyway, so you would want this on a, on a thicker paper that when bound as a book will, will be able to be, you know, dealt with with your hands. You will not have to use white gloves. You see what I mean? I did that same photo on aluminum by sublimation process. And um, I mounted it with two little 3D printed uh, little mounting thingies uh, that use um, uh, gel tape. And so it's at my daughter's house and it's floating off the wall. It looks really fantastic. Really, really great. Okay, so I'm going to remove that image, and I'm going to go ahead and we're going to do a little bit of um, we'll try some of this glossy paper from uh, Staples right here. See how this works out. I got a ton of images here I can experiment with. First, let's go ahead and check this out. So now we have ink on both sides. You see what I mean? It's got motion blur. And we flip it over. See that? I'm looking here for marks. Because that went upside down against those transport rollers. And so far, I think it's pretty pristine. So I think that worked. It's a little, this side is damp. I don't want to touch it too much. It's a little bit damp. You can see it's kind of curling. But yeah, that, that worked. Worked like a champ. So now I know I can get away with this. This is actually pretty good. Um... Didn't have much, much faith on it, but so far, so good. Okay, I'm going to look for an image. See how much time do we have? About 22 minutes. So I got I got to keep everything within uh, three hours every week. Otherwise, I get they nab me. Okay, so photos for shows. Is that it? 
yeah photos for demo so i got a ton of images here that i want to go ahead and play with this will look this looks kind of interesting but here's what i got to do first let's go ahead and set up our printer setup here correctly here's a premium presentation mat no we're printing on glossy now and again this is from uh, staples so we'll just have to use a generic uh, epson paper ultra premium paper luster no ultra premium paper photo paper glossy that's what we're going to use and i think i had a preset to have a border half inch border so that's it letting the driver control color is just going to use that premium paper glossy and i believe we have it on color mode so no problem and we'll pop that in there oh yeah but first of all i gotta remove that stupid see i used to have a habit of uh putting down these uh borders on my images so i'm going to just crop that off remove that you can't see what i'm doing but i'm just gonna do that behind the camera here and then we'll reload it and it will not have those strokes anymore that's when i used to print i used to print with pretty wide borders all the way around so these are um took five little peppers took them out to the uh, front and uh, took a photo of it so that's basically it let's see how that works on this glossy paper maybe i'll add let's see what else we have here we'll just do a, a quick run of several at the same time use things oh this is kind of oh wow where the heck is this in greece or something might as well right should i run a little black um stroke maybe let's go ahead and remove this we'll set up a little black stroke here maybe three pixels i think that's what it is pixels boom actually no wait a minute I set it for three and it showed it. Okay. Well, I still have three. Yes, I no, it went down to one. How come it's doing that? Maybe it doesn't want me to do that. <laughs> okay, forget it. It's okay. No biggie. Let's go back to oh. No, let's do that. How many sheets did I load? One, two, three. I think it's three. That's pretty heavy stuff, too. So, again, that's all from Staples. Maybe. This one. Oh, wow. That's pretty nice and graphic. Okay. That's it. We will load those three. This is on Staples. They had different types. I got to go back. It's just Photo Plus. And it's really hefty. It's got a nice weight to it. The three big images. It's going to take a bit to catch monitor here um, because it was not uh, showing you the uh, progress bar on the QImage app. Now you can see it. I think you can see it now. So we're at uh, 100. And on the other, because I have um, I have some of that matte paper underneath. I think I will do this image right here. Let me go ahead and remove these. I'm going to go ahead and reset this immediately. So we're going to go to printers. Go back to my matte paper. Premium presentation matte. And I think I'll keep this. We're going to remove the... Borderless, I'm going to set this to black and white mode. And now we're going to go to more options, advanced. And because this image, I'm going to, I haven't shown it to you yet, it's just black and white. 
then it doesn't matter. I'm going to, I'm going to leave it to darker. Okay. But I'm going to keep it at neutral. Nothing else is going to change and okay. And now I'm going to load this. I'm going to do this borderless. How about that? Let me see. Did I have it on borderless? I think I took it off of borderless. Yeah. Let's do this borderless. See how that works. Fit the page. Okay, that's not what we want. This is the one we want. Boom. Look at that. Yes. We'll print that on matte paper. That's that double-sided paper. But we'll only print on one side this time. Once it goes ding dong, I'm going to go ahead and set it back to not borderless. Take borderless off, put it back to color, and we'll do some color. Remove that. I'm going to add a border, half inch border, all around. Remove that again. I keep on, on, I need to unselect my image, Jose. Don't be silly. Okay, so here we go. Oh, that's pretty. That is so pretty. Boom. Well, I don't want it cropped. Undo cropping. Boom. Look at that. Oh, yeah. Let's print that. Gosh. Paper. For that, this should put us over the um, three hour limit. We have, oh gosh, how about this one? Whoa. What do you think that's going to come out like? Let's do it. I think that's enough. Let's just, let's just stop here. Okay. When it is queuing the jobs, it is really stressing my streaming abilities. So let's go back to me. Now everything is okay. Oh, boy. Oh, boy, is that pretty. Wait till you see this. Holy cow. <laughs> I'm going to have to make a trip to Staples. I want to go ahead and check what it says that they have. I'll take down the prices and uh, show you guys what you can get. And the quality of the papers is really top. It really uh, competes with even Canon Platinum, okay? I have a bunch of photo speed here, and I hope, and can send, look at photo speed, glossy sample pack, their photo sample pack, and their matte smooth, and I think I also have an art type sample, sample pack. I have a Canson Infinity list of papers. Look at the discovery pack. Look at all those papers that it comes with. Um... Here is Hannah Mule, and this is Glossy Fine Art, okay? I have Ilford Gallery, Prestige. I have, look at the size of this sample pack, okay? Uh, this is uh, from Breathing Color. Again, top, top, top quality stuff right here. And that'll have to wait. We're going to do that possibly the next week. And uh, what I'm going to do this week is continue uploading whatever I've done here in front of you all. I'm going to repeat as a short video and just post it individually. So 
So here's that first one. You know what? I think this was printed in black and white mode. Uh oh. But it's still gorgeous. Okay? Still beautiful. Remember I did that that one? Did I change it? I thought I did. When it started to come out, I thought, wait a minute, where did the color go? I'm going to have to do that again. Do one in color and one in black and white. How about that? If these other ones are coming out in black and white, then I'm going to be a little bit upset. But anyway, let's see. I'm going to check the driver. And we'll just load some more color. Okay, so I'm going to redo this one in color. It's going to be nice to see, you know, what it can do, right? No baby. I gotta do it before um, it begins to print the ones on mat. We're talking about maybe thirty cents for a page, a sheet. Yeah. How many did we do on Matt? I think it was. I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna wait until it runs out of paper. So we got one. One more in color in glossy. And I think it was two in matte. I'm gonna remove that. And it's gonna run out of paper anyway. So but yeah, I wanna definitely do the uh, color version of it. So I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, queue it up. Make sure that it's in color. Color. Premium presentation matte. We're going to change that to glossy. Let's see. Premium. Ultra premium glossy. That's what we're going to use. And uh, still in color. Okay. It's going to give me the signal. And print and go. Let's go. I think this one might be Josh. I think I may have done all of those in black and white mode, but Regardless, this is now I know that you can do this. You can do this even when having a color image queued. So you don't have to pre-convert to black and white. I, I think that's how it's working out. So, yeah. You got to remember that when you switch to a different media, it's going to recall what setting that media was set for. So... It, it kind of uh, reminds you that you have to check. You have to check your settings. QMH has memory. They, 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 it works on your previous job for a printer, a paper, size, whatever. It remembers that, and it will default itself to that setting when you switch to another paper. I think that's what happened, and I, of course, I didn't check. So... I think it, it very easily will. Yeah, it's, it's really, really good. And eight and a half by 11, I don't know what that equates to in the A series, A4 uh, or A5. Um, the price is like under $20 for 150 sheets. Here. Yeah, black and white mode. <laughs> but again, it's neutral. 
It's beautiful. You can probably go one notch lighter in this case. Now, you know very well I changed it to color on the other. Um, well, what it, you know, a glossy paper, traditional glossy paper for darkroom use had to be ferrotyped. And ferrotyping means that you have a, a beautifully chrome-plated sheet of metal that has absolutely no scratches, nothing on it, and it is polished to a mirror finish. You take your wet, glossy, you know, the, your F, F surface paper, lay it down wet, and you roll it on and let it dry. Unfortunately, it would dry in sections, and you would get these marks. Uh, on a paper dryer, you would have a big heated drum with a canvas belt, and then that drum would be lined with the ferrotype uh, metal. Outside would be the shiny part, so you would lay down out of the print washer. You would put your papers down in this orientation. They would then be sandwiched against the ferrotype plate, and the canvas would hold it in place. The heat will melt that surface and basically make it shiny. I don't like it. I did not like it. I always um, put my prints facing down against the canvas. So you get more of an N type surface look. But now we have digital, so you no longer have to worry about that. I'm pretty amazed how this came out. Still, still a little damp. That was a lot of ink being laid down on something this thin. There's another shot of my daughter and she's got tears in her eyes. So the only thing you have to make sure of is that it's in the correct orientation. So this album would be viewed, would be bound here. And you view it this way. Okay. And if I had vertical um, photographs, I would make sure that I would frame them, putting backgrounds and maybe cockeyed a little bit and floating with a drop shadow. Yeah, that's that's what I used to do. I used to prepare these album pages for people and uh, they loved it. Oh boy, another color, another black and white one. Which one was that? I think this is a Greek one. Anyway, at least we get to see that if you use black and white mode, it does a pretty good, um, you know, conversion from color. The one thing you have to be aware of is that when you convert to black and white from a color image in something like Photoshop, you can adjust the colors. Even though now they're all grays, you can adjust the reds, the greens, the yellows, the blues, the browns, yeah. Sliding little sliders and you can adjust um, the shot of the boat on the lake. It had a yellow section and a dark red section on the boat. But when you convert it to black and white without having to, without doing any of those extra manipulations, you get two white surfaces. Even though the red was actually denser, should have been a darker gray. Well, you would have to go in and manually adjust that yourself. And uh, that would immediately change it. Can I use Canon black card with PC for the rest of the cards for the rest of the cards on my Pro 100? Yeah. You just want to black the photo black cartridge filled with PC inks while the rest are not? Is that what you're saying? Sure. Yeah. The matching is so good that, you know, in fact, Yep, black and white mode again. But look at that. That's that's pretty neat. 
This looks wow. This looks like a like a real photograph. Actually, guys, you were asking about that. This really looks good. Uh, I'm I'm loving the uh, black and white mode. Okay, so we should be getting color this time. Gosh, we got another minute to go here, but that's okay. We can stay a little bit beyond. Wait for these prints to finish coming out, and uh, and we'll bid you all goodbye. If you guys want me to replay the um, slideshow, I will do that. If not, I'll just say goodbye and we'll shut off the light stream. But um, it doesn't take too much effort to create one of those slideshows. It's actually quite easy. It uses auto synchronization for the audio and the slide for the transitions to take place on a beat. It's really neat. It's called Photodex. Uh, unfortunately, it's no longer made. They never uh, they stopped using it, and they I think it became something else by another company. It was Pro Show by Photodex. I use the automated mode. I use the theme and then just let it do its things. But you can do things manual if you want. It's just unlimited what you can do in motion graphics within that application. Okay, so this one coming out, definitely we were doing in black and white mode, is that shot of the trees, uh, the branches, and borderless. So this this is on matte paper. This should be fantastic. So what would you guys like me to do on the 8550? Why don't you guys throw some suggestions to me? Uh, we've done Canvas. We've done, um, I don't want to do disc printing. That's just very, you know, obvious. You put the disc holder in the straight path and it'll print on a disc. I can do that on the Pro 10 as well. Pro 100 also has that as well. Um, but, you know, give me some suggestions. All I can do continually, continually is to test more different medias on it just to see how. That's why I pulled out my fancy, fancy media pile here. And we'll see how it works, how it handles those uh, big names, uh, because it's sure handling the uh, lower name uh, media and making it look gorgeous. Yeah, this is this is the matte stuff. Wow, that is so good, man. You would never suspect that six. You guys got to take this under consideration. You don't have, you don't have light magenta you don't have light cyan or two grays you just have magenta cyan and yellow and one gray and black that's it one gray and one black this reminds me whoever brought up the darkroom um yeah this is just like it wow That is so good. Okay, let me show you the other one. I mean, come on. <laughs> that is fantastic. And again, this is kind of flimsy. It's not double weight, <laughs> but it's dirt cheap. So you want to practice? Hmm? You want to practice and not spend $3 a sheet just to practice? This is the way to go. I got to find some more sources of material like this to pass on to you guys and, you know, Unfortunately, if you're not here in the U.S., I don't know whether you can find equivalents in Europe, uh, other parts of the world, for that matter. But, yeah, this is crazy. And, again, I haven't, I've been ignoring this stuff for years, and apparently it's still good. I don't know whether this has a lot of OBAs in it, but I don't see any yellowing on the edges, and that's a clear um, warning that you have uh, 
burning out OEMs, uh, o OBAs, I mean, not OEMs. Okay, color, finally. Gee whiz. Gosh. Look at that. You guys remember what it looked like. Look at that. This is with basically the simplest color management. Okay. I'm just letting the driver control color. We're letting QImage do that. QImage is, is, is different than, than printing with the driver at the default setting, which is usually sRGB or some other enhancement or this and that. No, no, no. We're using QImage, which is then taking the paper choice that I chose, okay, on the drop-down menu, and then aligning it with the correct matching ICC profile. So we are printing with color management. We're simply letting QImage go through the driver and setting it correctly for you automatically. That's why QImage kicks ass. Okay? It really does. Okay, so I think I need to add some paper. Let me see. I don't know. Gosh, I don't know what paper to add. Oh, boy. Let me see. See, I don't know which job is going to be next. I think I think I only did two of these matte. I'm going to put the glossy paper. Hopefully, that's the one that we want. If not, we're all just going to laugh. It won't be funny, but I won't be laughing. But you guys can laugh at me. Okay, I hope that's the job that this window that we did in black and white accidentally. I just want to see what it looks like in, in color on that nice glossy paper. Once it starts to emerge, I'll know. But again, this is this is awesome. And it's like perfectly neutral. So by accident, and that's all this is, it's by accident, this is a perfect match. Staples plus glossy, whatever, glossy plus, and ultra glossy from Epson. Perfect match. Yeah, ultra premium photo paper glossy. Boom. Please let it be in color, please. You know what I'm afraid to do? I'm afraid to go to my Pro 1 and or my Pro 1000, that is, and try any of this and expect to see night and day differences in quality. I don't think that's going to happen. That would be scary. At the same time, you know, whoa. Oh, oh, okay. Let me put some more. That's another one. I forgot we did the uh, flame. Let me do another sheet of glossy. I'm going to put one more. Remember the candle? That's what's coming up next. Just in case, I'm putting two sheets. Good Lord. Whoa. Okay, I get questions about all oh, my reds, my oranges, my greens, my whatever are just not brilliant enough. <laughs> well, I did not sneak this from like some place under my table here. This is for real. I really did produce this just now. It's, it's nuts. Look at this. Come on. Here. Don't touch it. It's hot. You see that? Okay. So remember that paper that had the swallowable surface? 
that black would have just been wet. Look, no problem. So that's what modern papers do, but modern papers will not protect this print. Okay, you have to take extra steps. Look, at you can see my monitor. <laughs> you can see my monitor right on it. Wow. That is insane. Holy mackerel. Okay, if this is the one that I have still here, and that'll that'll be it for the day. And we call this whole thing a success today. I didn't screw up once. I think I, I got everything to go. Let me see what else we got here. So we have some people here. Some people are saying goodbye. They need to leave. Okay. No use can OEM ink for the black only to address black. Oh, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All righty. We'll see you next time. You see, uh, again, it depends. I haven't had any problems. It depends on your on your conditions. The paper, high OBAs will fade extremely quickly. Um, they did um, a company called Ardenberg Imaging did a test on the Pro One Thousand. Pro One Thousand with OB o, OEM, OEM inks on their own pro luster paper and the exposure to light went up to like 13 megalux and by simply switching to palo duro soft gloss the one that i just that i have 73 megalux before you saw any fader at all is the paper the paper has a lot to do with it as well and this was with the best inks. Compare the prints from the 8550 to the Pro 100, both with OEM inks. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not using OEM inks on the uh, Pro 100. Um, let me just say that Precision Colors inks excelled Pro 100 inks OEM. Okay, they were better. Longevity, of course not. But color-wise, output-wise, they were better. When the, when the Canon company put out their Pro 200, they addressed the same problems that Precision Colors saw and solved with their Signature Edition ink. Yeah. How about black ink and the CIS for the Pro 100 that it came with? Jose, you tested it not so long ago. Does that black fade? No idea. Fading can take years. Fading can take a lot longer than just a day or two. So there's no way for me to know. How much do you charge for photo prints? I don't. I don't sell anything. Palo Duro from Red River, yes, sir. Have you topped off your Epson 8550 ink tank yet? No, I have not. And I've been printing like not. I, I, I thought I had a flashlight here, but I do not. But they're down to here. They're down to here right now. And the black is down to just here right now. Oh, here it comes. Yay, we got it. Now I'm looking over there and I'm looking over here. Perfect match. I still have that loaded. I still have that loaded. It's got a little bit more to go. Believe it or not, I'm looking at the bricks. <laughs> I'm, I'm checking out the bricks to see what we get in color. Remember, black and white mode, not at all connected with regular uh, color managed workflow with an ICC profile. This may not be a perfect match, but we are able to produce a linearly neutral result for whatever the reason with that particular paper, this printer, and its default settings. Okay, this is a little bit warmer than that. So again, all you need to do, all you need to do is a profile. But again, I'm I'm blasting it with some off-color 
illumination from my monitor. This is not the way to display photos, folks. But for black and white, yeah, you can get away with that, but not in there. Look, I'm getting a reflection of some little green LED or something. I think it's my microphone. So, but yeah, let me let me find the other one. We'll put it side by side. Gosh, I think I prefer the black and white one. I'll tell you the truth. Yeah, it's just a little bit more graphic. But again, beautiful. Great results, no marks, no problems. Wow. So you guys cannot come up with something that you would like me to uh, try? I would love it if somebody would suggest something. Uh, let's see. You're causing me to really like the 8550 if it's the only one's an 87, uh, eight, 17 inch printer. Yeah, um, they're not about to shoot themselves on the foot mm -mm. because they want you to buy the, the P900. Okay, that's what they really want you to buy. 8550 is not for serious, serious photographers. Yeah, right. So that's not what they would like you to do. So there's no way. It's a dream of mine. If they come, oh my God, can you imagine? And say they add two more colors. Say they add, I don't know, light magenta or maybe a red uh, or a blue. The XP 15,000, I think, has red. If they add red, they just need to make the printhead a little bit bigger. That's all. The the unit a little bit wider. That's all. And then 17 inch would be what? Four inches wider than a current 13 inch printer. So you add width to allow for that extra. There's no way they're going to do that. Now, the only way they could get away with that would be to make it impossible to install a roll adapter. So you would have a 17, 17 inch capacity eco tank with an extra color, proprietary red. <clears throat> and then you could possibly cut your own sheets if that's what you want. Or they could be really creepy and just the driver is restricted to how long a piece of paper you can feed through it and print on it, you see. Um, because the P900, you can buy a roll adapter for it. It works fine, just like my P800 roll adapter. I can print uh, 510 inches. Who the heck would do that, right? But you can do that. You can technically you can. So I like to see a session where you start with raw files and process them for printing, then print them, or show how you optimize match papers to different photos. Well, the raw files I usually go through um, Lightroom. I, I work through Lightroom and I set it a specific way so that it gives me a warning of my uh, highlight clipping and my shadow clipping. And there is a method that I use uh, that emphasizes or at least maximizes the final uh, dynamic range of the image. So you may end up, you may start off with a, a raw file that looks kind of dull by comparison. So you look at the, the histogram in both the right side and left side, they have space in them. Of course, you can just do that manually, but by using the method that I use, it actually physically shows you, uh, oh, you're about to clip those shadows of my idea because printers will clip shadows to begin with and highlights. That is just a natural thing with ink on paper viewed by reflective light. By transmission is different, but by reflective light, light the zero to six might be completely blocked. You may not be able to see those steps. Zero to two fifty-five, that is black to white to paper by base. So, by making sure that nothing, nothing on that image is actually zero, and making sure that nothing, unless it's a specular highlight like a chrome with the sun shining on it and you see the sun. Yeah, that would be 255. But otherwise, if there is no specular highlights, 
everything has to be 254 or below and one and above or maybe two and above and i have a way to do that and so then you adjust your tonal range in the middle without affecting those nailed down limits you see and then it's a matter of your colors and lightroom allows you to adjust only the reds only the blues only the greens only the oranges only the yellows if you wish and you can do that in color mode or you can do that in black and white mode lightroom was invented by two photographers who worked in the dark room okay get it so now you work in a light room although this is dark but you see what i mean so a lot of the technology a lot of the the, the thinking the, the 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 way the terminology is translated over to lightroom that's why i like it i like it a lot some people don't i love it i've been with it since lightroom one so all right that is going to be it maybe we'll do that next time okay thanks for the reminder i'm, I'm going to go ahead and set that up for next time maybe what i will do is prepare a video which then i will then load here because working on lightroom at the same time as i am you know updating or uploading uh, via streaming it might be a little stressful for my system so maybe i will make a video covering that uh, process and then we'll just play it while i uh relax for a change um, unless i i think as we were told by mike cheney uh not next week but probably the week after thanksgiving both of those guys will be here with us and then we'll go ahead and drill them for all the questions that we may have about q image um, they're going to have a sale i think for black friday so make sure that you use my affiliate link so that you guys get a double discount if you if you're on the fence about buying q image all right for me it is the program to print through period period photoshop has printing lightroom has printing but i export anything i create in photoshop or lightroom over to q image there is a plugin that you can get as well all right so that's gonna be it let me see one more here okay yeah yeah i'll, I'll go ahead and do that that way it'll be nicely edited without any mistakes right so we will see you let me pre let me prep this so that i can maybe play that video again for you guys and we'll just let it go ahead and play and then uh, it'll just bid us goodbye let me load this up get this set up and we'll go ahead and go back to my branding let me see anything else make sure that we have everybody taking care of here all right i think that's it so we will go ahead and end the broadcast after the video is played so we will see you on the next sunday bye bye everybody mm -hmm.